Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for tuning in today. This is Henrik and it's good to be back with you once again. We uh, had some traveling to do at the end of last week into this one. So we had to skip a couple of shows to be able to keep up with everything going on. So uh, we say thank you to everyone who tunes in regularly for understanding. You know, we never really take breaks from the show, not even over Christmas, New Year's or Easter. So I'm sure you're cool with us going out there getting some footage for future projects. So anyway, if you're new to this show, tuning in for the first time or just stumble across us, the best place to check us out is at RedEyesCreations.com. Go there for radio shows, news, videos and more. We uh, return to today not on an easy note. We're going to hit you off with a heavy topic. I wish it was something else, but uh, in all sincerity, the topic we'll be discussing today is something that we've put off for way too long here on Red Eyes Radio. But we all know how the media lie distorts things and gives us the wrong information and use it for purposes sometimes very clear to us and other times not so clear. Well, it's safe to say that the lies about South Africa and the Boer people in particular have been one of distortion from day one, ever since the British turned on them. Today we have a long show for you. We've made it into one segment so that you can hear the full story. It's just uh, too important and urgent as well. Our guest is Karen Smith. She's an expat South African living in Texas. She studied nursing at Grace Hospital in Pietermaritzburg and worked in the casino industry and for the biggest supermarket chain in South Africa, both upper management positions dealing with the unions. She has been an activist calling for world attention to the genocide of the Boer people in Africa for at least 10 years. Her family fled the civil war in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe and eventually settled as a farmer in South Africa, where her family of five siblings and both parents have suffered attacks by AK-47-wielding gangs twice in the last three years, resulting in the death of her father last September. And as always, folks, uh, hear our guests out and look into it for yourself. If you dig deep enough, you'll find that there is a wall of lies that has been in place for over two decades now, preventing you or anyone else from knowing the real story of the horrors of what is happening in the Rainbow Nation. Well, here's a chance for you to get a glimpse of the other side that they never tell you about. Welcome, Karen. Thank you so much for coming on with us. It's uh, good to speak with you. Hope you're uh, doing okay today. Thank you very much, Henrik, for giving me this opportunity to spread the word about the disaster that the Rainbow Nation has begun and the problems that the poor whites in South Africa are suffering. Yeah, you bet. This is a huge topic. We have a lot to discuss and a lot of different facets to this. And, and obviously, as always, we have to kind of set the, the framework a little bit for our audience as well so they understand what we're talking about here. But I mean, I think just at, at the outset here, we can just preface this by saying, as, as we know in the, in the alternative media, <laughs> we know that the media always gives us the, the full story and whatever they say is, of course, gospel and we should never question it and just take everything at face value, which is why I've had such a difficult time with some in the alternative uh, who just don't understand that certain things that are told to us are just simply not true and they end up repeating many many of these lies and one of the big ones of course is about what is happening in South Africa and what has happened uh, there from the from the beginning pretty much and and how history has been used been used against the Europeans who who came there in the in the early days but before we dive into the present situation and talk about what actually is happening right now, give us a little bit of, of the background story and tell us how Europeans to begin with ended up in South Africa. Well, um, the first people to even look at South Africa were the Portuguese. They came and did a few sorties inland and decided they didn't like the Cape of Good Hope and they moved on and settled Mozambique and Angola. And then the Dutch East India Company desperately needed a refreshment station for the ships going around the Cape of Good Hope, Good Hope to, the, to the east um, on the Spice Route. So they sent Jan van Riebeck in 1652 to not to colonize South Africa, but to open a refreshment station for the ships passing. So he was, he was the first uh, South African governor, as it were, and there were a lot of indentured servants that were planting uh, vegetable farms, etc., for the ships. Now, when they landed there, there were no blacks in South Africa whatsoever. There was one little group of blacks who are not really the big 
pitch black uh, African warriors that one thinks about Africa being infested with. They were small, little, short, light-skinned, almost of the Bushman tribe, and they were called the Koi Koi, which means the men of men. They were a very small tribe, and they were the only, only indigenous tribe of South Africa when Jan van Rivik landed. So they started growing vegetables and trading uh, with the Koi Koi for beef, and um, eventually the indentured service had servants had paid off their in, indenturedness and started striking out to get farms of their own. So that is how it started being colonized in the Cape Colony. Well, there was a ruckus between the, the Dutch and the British, and the British took over the Cape Colony. And the Afrikaner settlers, they, they were the original Dutch settlers there. Well, and what, what year are we talking about here approximately? Um, about a hundred years after the first settlement at the Cape, mm -hmm. um, the British took over and the, the, the Boers who have been very independent, religious, free thinkers all their lives, they, uh, didn't like the liberal attitude of the British. They thought they were far too liberal and they also didn't want to pay taxes to the British. So they got into their covered wagons and they trekked inland to get away from this liberal rule. And on the way, so this is now 120 years after the first settlement in the Cape. On their, on their treks north and northeast, they met up with the Zulu nation who had been coming south throughout Africa. And on their way, annihilating, annihilating all the black tribes in their path, enslaving the women and children and killing the men and stealing the cattle. Now, they had wiped out hundreds of thousands of blacks on their way south. And they met the, the Boers who were going north. They met them at a kind of a natural barrier that occurs in South Africa between the lovely sort of semi-Mediterranean um, areas up north and the colder, more barren areas down south. And the Boers and they met um, the ha halfway, as I say, and had some horrific, horrific clashes with the Zulus. Um, one a case in point being the Battle of Blood River, which was a historic a, a battle which has never been equaled in the history of mankind, where five, approximately 500 Boers knew that they were going to have to fight the Zulu. So they got on their knees and they prayed for seven days and said, God, if you give this battle into our hands, we, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, will celebrate this day, will dedicate it to you for all eternity. Well, these 500 Boers, all men, because they didn't want to bring their women and children into this battle, they had a, a circle of wagons, and in the wagon wheels, they put uh, thorn bushes so the Zulu warriors can't crawl into the middle um, through the wheels. And they fought off between 15 and 20,000 black Zulu warriors who came at them from all sides. At the end of the day, they found, well, they documented three and a half thousand dead Zulu, but I don't think they counted all of them. And not one, not one Boer was killed in that battle. Three of them were lightly wounded, but as for the rest of that 500 who fought 15 to 20,000 Zulus, not one died. Now in the history of the world, there has never been a battle like that or with a result like that. So that day is commemorated until today, but the blacks in South Africa are trying to prevent it from being um, commemorated any further. Uh, it's called the Day of Remembrance. It's celebrated on the 16th of December, and the, the Afrikaners gather at the Fuertrecker Monument in Pretoria, and they pray and have church services throughout the country on that day to commemorate it in honor of their promise to God. Mm. So that was one of the major battles where they really defeated the Zulu. And uh, the Zulu took a beating and were very, very nervous of the whites after that. It was 1838, by the way, for those who don't know. 
yes. Yep. Um, and so that the, the Boers then decided that they would go and speak to the king of the Zulus and ask him for a piece of land that would belong to them, where they would literally have a cease, ceasefire, they would be self-ruling, and the blacks would, would not attack them on this piece of land. So Petrotiv and a couple of uh, um, South African Boers went to meet with the king, and they had a whole days of celebration, etc., etc., and the king agreed to it. And Petrotiv tucked this piece of paper, well, parchment, I should imagine, where the king had put his thumbprint and agreed to the piece of land that the Boers would have from him. On a piece of paper, he tucked it into a leather satchel. Well, that same night, the... Zulu king stood up and yelled, Burala to Gati, which means kill the white wizards. And his men descended on this deputation of Boers and slaughtered the whole lot of them. But that piece of parchment with his, his thumbprint on it survived that battle. So the, the original land where the Boers settled was bought from the Zulu king for them to settle, settle on, although... At that time, the land was not owned by anybody because the blacks and the whites were both immigrant settlers in that land. Mm -hmm. We're bypassing a lot of history here, but the Boers set up two republics, the Republic of the Orange Free State and the Republic of the Transvaal. And those were their own little countries which were acknowledged by the rest of the world, and they were uh, ruled by themselves. And... They didn't have very many huge towns because they were a farming community. They obviously were towns because that's where all trade happens and bartering, etc. But then gold and diamonds were found. Now, the British had colonized uh, Natal, and they looked at this gold and, and diamonds in the Boer communities, and they thought, no, this is a total threat to Britain's um, colonization policy, these people are going to get too rich, rich and become difficult. <laughs> and that is how the two Boer Wars, start, Boer Wars started. Yeah, didn't like the British largely, they kind of pulled out and said, ah, you know what, we, we don't have too much interest in it. Then their resources were, were found and immediately they went back in there, right? Exactly. Yeah. They had kind of left these two little, little republics alone to rule themselves, to get on with it themselves, because they were no threat to anybody. They were subsistence farmers and very rural communities. They, they were no, and they were small, so they were no threat to anybody. So the British had left them alone. But then gold was found in the Transvaal and diamonds were found in the Free State. And the British uh, saw this as a, a quick money-making scheme for their colonial efforts, and the Boer were, wars were fought. Now, the First Boer War, the Boers lost. They, they fought by guerrilla tactics, and the, the, they lost that one. Now, the Second Boer War, which is the most important one, well, I, I'm sorry, I can't think of the year right now. But anyway, uh, the, the British brought in troops from Britain. This, this was a guaranteed one-on-one, face-to-face, huge war going to happen. But the Boers did not have that kind of structure. The commandos that they fought in were not paid by the state. They were not um, organized by the state. They were farmers. So they had to f take their own weapon, their own ammunition, and eight days' supplies in their saddlebags when they went to war. Now, they rode little Boer ponies. Uh, they had tattered, earth-colored clothes that were obviously made at home. And they did not go to war in the way that the British did with their red jackets and their drums beating, etc., etc. So these Boers uh, did guerrilla attacks on the, Boer, uh, on the British um, supply lines and on the British. So the British never knew where they were going to be hit or where these Boers were going to come from next. But as in the South, uh, in the Civil War, the Boers, every farmer was their friend. So they could go to a farm at any time, replenish their supplies, get a good night's sleep, and then go back to fighting. When the British realized this, they realized that every farmhouse was a supply line for the Boer commandos. So they went in, <coughs> excuse me, and instituted a scorched earth policy. 
they burnt the farms, they salted the earth, they killed the cattle, they imprisoned the women, children and elderly who were left behind on the farms and put them in concentration camps. Now those British concentration camps were an absolute travesty of, well, uh, when we get to it later, you will see that the, the, the squatter camps today with the white snow are exactly the same kind of thing. Mm. But they, the British um, didn't take care of these people at all. They lived, if, if they had a cover over their heads at all, they lived in tents. They suffered from malnutrition. They died of starvation, cholera, typhoid, all kinds of horrific diseases because the British didn't really care about them at all. So the Boers got discouraged because they, they were fighting this war to keep their families safe and free and their families were dying like flies. 20% of the Boer population died in those concentration camps. So the Boers flew the white flag of surrender um, in order to, to stop any further deaths amongst the women and children. Well, they, they informed the Union of South Africa, the British did, and the Boers were uh, supposedly on, in control of their own two little republics. They were uh, under British rule, but were allowed to run those two republics um, by their own laws, their own moral standards, etc., but they had to pay ta taxes and things to the Brits. Well, around that same time, uh, Barney Bonato and Cecil John Rhodes uh, rose to fame, and they started buying up all the little diggings in the diamond and gold fields until they became a huge big conglomerate, um, which was De Beers and Anglo-American, um, the diamonds and the gold, and Britain was getting rich off of all of these things. Yeah. So, so that's essentially the... The, the history of the South African Boer who has always only ever wanted a place where he could live with his own religion, his own language and be free of the rules imposed by the rest of the world which do not sit well with them. And to this day, that is all that the Afrikaner wants. He doesn't want to rule anybody else. He doesn't want to be somebody else's boss. He just wants to be boss of his own life. Well, it, it shows a little bit of the nuanced uh, infighting during the colonial times of European history as well. We um, Today, I, I would say we get a very simplified uh, version of history, and it's, it's, almost, it's almost turned into such a simplified thing that it's almost like, well, you know, it was kind of, it was the Europeans, like the, the white race against everyone else, and they wanted to subjugate them under under their rule, you know, which is <laughs> it's just ridiculous. I mean, th this shows that it was like, there was tons of infighting between the different colonial powers, and they didn't do anything because it was like, oh, they had a racial, uh, you know, a brotherhood sense of we're going to take care of each other against, you know, the black man or the brown man or anything ridiculous like that. This was very evident that the, the interest was on a completely different le level than, than on a racial level. Yes, yes. But another interesting point that people need to understand is that the apartheid laws, which the whole world stood up against after 1948 when, when the National Party took over South Africa, those laws were instituted as early as 1913 by the British, not by the Afrikaners. The British instituted laws where you could not in, have interracial marriage, where, where um, blacks had to live separately, etc. They instituted that. The British did that. So when the, when the National Party took over in 1948 and South Africa became the Republic of South Africa, they, in an act of self-defense, because by that time, the black hordes had become, uh, had outnumbered the white Boers. So in an act of self-defense, they tightened up those segregation laws uh, to maintain their white space where they lived uh, and keep them secure against the hundreds of thousands of blacks. Because by that time, there were cities, there were areas of commercial um, 
uh, richness. Success, and, yeah. Yes, a, a huge success th that the blacks wanted to take advantage of. So they were pouring in from all over Africa to try and be become a part of this commercial good life. And so the, the, the white South Africans said, look, there are very, very few of us, and we have to keep ourselves and our way of living safe. So what they did was they, they gave each black tribe their own homeland. So the Zulus got Zululand, and the Vendors got, um, oh, well, they got Venda, yes. Mm -hmm. And the Kozas got Kozaland, and the Basutu, uh, I can't remember what tribe got Baputotswana. But in any case, they each got their own homeland. And these were not pieces of land in the middle of the desert where nothing grew. Because Zululand, which is still ruled by a Zulu king to this day, is one of the most fertile, most incredible places in South Africa. The, they, they were given good land where things grew, where minerals were found, where mining was happening. The South African white taxpayer paid for infrastructure, roads, hospitals, schools, universities, airstrips, um, you name it, the South, uh, electricity, running water, sewerage, all of those things were paid for by the very small white tax base in South Africa. And many of the blacks today benefited immensely from that because they were educated. None of the black tribes had any written language whatsoever. They had not invented the wheel. They did not ride horses. They did not have uh, cities or, or anything that was of any use. They used to pick up their huts when they'd graze the area flat, put their, fold their little huts up, put them over their back, and go and look for the next patch of green grass. So those people owned nothing, did nothing. They, they now wanted to flock into the white areas and be part of the white expansion, the white uh, creativity. Now, so let me ask you uh, quickly here. You said, yeah, so 19, about 1948, the Republic of South Africa was created. Was when, when, the, uh, when this was, well, carved up, I guess, for the lack of a better term, was, was the British involved in that? Or was this solely uh, what South Africa did at the time? Was anyone else involved in that, do you know? Um, the British were involved in what happened. With, with they, the British, you have to understand, had an, a major, major, major impact on what happens in South Africa. Yeah. South Africa is still ruled by the British, British law system. I mean, it, it's, it's really funny to see these black judges, etc., with their little white curly wigs on their heads. Um, the parliamentary system of Britain is still used in South Africa by mm -hmm. the British government. So Britain had an enormous, enormous impact on South Africa. And they had a say in everything. Um, as you know, they, they had a say in handing South Africa over to the ANC government uh, yep. 50 years after uh, the, it was the, the South African government was formed. So, yes, they did have a big say in it, but the, the Boers tried to be fair. They did not want to rule the blacks at all. They just wanted their own place. But by default, when South Africa was handed over to them in 1948 by the British, they became the rulers of all this whole black, con black country where they were besieged and outnumbered. Mm. So, so segregation really was a form of self-defense for the South Africans. So it was like um, a, they, they, were, they were spearheading this idea a little bit that a minority should be protected as they are protected in other European countries today. But hindsight then, if we take the, uh, the, the mainstream view here, despite that the fact that they were a minority, no, they shouldn't have been protected at all, it seems like. It seems like they should have just picked up and, and, and left what they fought for, it seems like, right? Well, it would seem that way, and to this very day, that same story is being told, that they must go away. Right. But these were hardy people. Um, they had fled from, from, well, the French Huguenots, for instance, had fled from, from religious persecution. Right, yep. Um, in, in, um, they, they had fled from France to, to the Netherlands, and then came, well, they went all over the world. Um, but the ones that came to South Africa, they planted the first vines and 
and wine farms in South Africa, which exists to this day, with some of the best wines in the world made there. So they were a polyglot of people. They weren't just Dutch, they were French, they were Portuguese, they were Germans, because we had German, German East Africa, which is now Namibia, became Southwest Africa and then Namibia. So they were all kinds of European people mixed together, but still very, very few of them, because South Africa is big, and they were settled widely, I mean, from the Cape right up to the borders of Zimbabwe. And they didn't really want to be townies or, or commercial people. They just wanted to farm. So they were scattered. And they yeah, were... But what, that area, I'm just looking at a map now to explain to our audience too. It's basically like, well, what can we say? Like Germany, Poland, Holland, Belgium, maybe all put together or something like that. It's, it's, it's a big area. Yeah. Yes, it is. It, it's a little bit bigger than Texas. So I, mm -hmm. because I live in Texas, that's how I equate it for a, an American audience because they can understand better that way. It is bigger than Texas, but not by very much. So, mm. all right. So these, these, these boys then inherited this whole mess left to them by the British. And they did the best they could to, to make sure that every tribe, because don't forget, these tribes warred with each other. They hated each other. They were warring tribes, yep. wiping each other off. So in order to protect the tribes from each other and the whites from the blacks, the government then inst tightened up the apartheid rules. And, well... Well, ex explain to us. I, I know there might be more you want to, uh, you know, detail for yeah. us there. And please go ahead. But... Also explain what that what that means. What 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 was apartheid? Apartheid, in in its translation, means separateness. So apartheid, at the root of apartheid is a separate development, separate but self-ruled for all, for all. So no matter who you were, you lived separately and you ruled yourself by your own rules and morals and ethics. You spoke your own language and whatever, but the whites would at the same time help you to come into the, the, the modern century by giving you hospitals and roads and, and schools and clinics and everything free, just by the way, in the black homelands. Everything was free. Not so much for the white people who lived there. So separate development is basically what apartheid is. And uh, we had it here in, in the States. It was segregation. It's the same thing. The blacks were not allowed to go into white hotels. They were not allowed to, they were whites only benches. They were whites only um, waiting rooms. They were whites only toilets. But at the same time, they were blacks only as well. So right. they were side by side. It wasn't that the black was just left, well, I need the toilet and I've got nowhere to go. No, he had his own places in the white areas, not just in his homeland, in the white areas. But there were very strict rules, uh, like white by night. The white suburbs in the towns in South Africa were white by night. And if a black were to be found on the street there, the police would arrest him and demand to know why he was there. So there was a pass system instituted. And this is one of the biggest, the, the starters of the biggest problems in South Africa, where the Dom Pass is what the, the blacks called them, the stupid pass. Now, they had to carry this at all times. And if they were found without it, they would be arrested and thrown into jail. And if they were found where they shouldn't be at a time where they shouldn't be, they would be arrested and thrown into jail, and they would be left to explain what they were doing there. And this was to keep the white suburbs free of these marauding blacks um, during the nighttime hours. But at the same time, what the world does not tell you is that the whites also had to carry a pass, an ID book. You had to have it on you at all times. You have a number given to you at your birth, your identity number, and that number sticks with you until you die. And um, in your identity book was put your birth certificate, your firearm license, your driver's license, your marriage certificate, your name and address, everything pertaining to your life was in that book. And you had to have it with you at all times. Uh, so, le sorry, let me explain something here as well, because uh, you raise a very important point that the the idea of, of separateness is something that, I mean, people have to 
you know, take away the association that we have to this today. And you have to understand the historical background to this. This is what the Brit- British did. They, when they came into certain areas, even when they pulled out, actually, in an effort to try to um, have some kind of stability when they left. And again, we can think whatever we want about this. But the fact is, a- another example is look at how they uh, carved up India and Pakistan, for example. These were not areas that were... Uh, you know, divided in that way before. They said, well, okay, you're a Muslim population, Pakistanis, you need to go up here. And, you know, the rest of the Hindus and uh, and other religions go down to India. And it was an effort to try to, it was just a mentality of the time. It wasn't, uh, I think we have a different relationship to it today of, of thinking, oh my God, they're like tr- trying to prevent people from live together. It was, a, it was an effort, whether it was right or wrong, but it was an effort to try to create conditions where people could live in relative peace uh, I, th- I think considering how how um, how instrumental the British had been anyway in terms of uh, kind of uprooting the, the the normality of a lot of these people, the British were very technologically advanced. They, in some cases, set up different types of governments and whatnot. So I think it was an effort to do something good. And I think that's also is the imp- is the system that came out of uh, uh, or or that was imposed on South Africa as well. I think, Karen. Uh, absolutely, um, Hendrik. It was like that, but but it was it, it was a, a thing of the times. That exactly. Yeah. Exactly. In those times, yes, we look at it very differently today. It was shock and horror, but at the time, that was how things were done, and the British had the biggest empire in the entire world. They ruled, and what they said happened. Yep. Uh, that was the end of it. Their laws were followed, and so they left the the Boers with this system in place. Now, those words had never known anything different. Th- that is how life was, and that's how it was supposed to be. And you have to understand that the, the Boers as well have always thought of themselves as a w- lost tribe of Israel. Now, whether correctly or incorrectly, I'm not commenting on that. I'm simply saying that that is what they have always considered themselves, wandering in the desert with no place to call their home, and that they have been oppressed and murdered and hurt and damaged, and they still do not have a place to call their own. And and that is part of the belief system of the Boers. So they have they felt that they had a right to exist in a country which they had built from absolute bush. That there was nothing there when they got there. And from that they built up the modern South Africa which was the powerhouse of the entire Africa. And Africa is enormous. People don't realize that. But, I mean, all the countries of the world just about fit into Africa with room to spare. Yeah. And uh, the, the South Africa, this tiny little little place on the southernmost tip of Africa, was the powerhouse of that huge continent. They had everything. They have they are strategically very important to the rest of the world because they have every mineral known to mankind. Um, they have silver, they have gold, they have potassium, they have uh, steel, they, they have everything, copper, everything is found in South Africa except the one thing that to run a modern country you need, which is gas. We do not have gas, known as gas in, in, in the States, known as petrol, in South Africa, we do not have that. And that was one of the biggest drawbacks when sanctions were, were imposed against us. But this little race of people, hardy, hardworking, God-fearing, um, independent, stubborn, stubborn as mules, people built that little piece of land into an absolute paradise. Because South Africa, again, this year, was voted the most beautiful country in the world. We have from subtropical to snowy mountains where you can ski. We have the most beautiful golden beaches in the entire world. On the, on the eastern side of South Africa, we have warm currents coming down from Mozambique. So the sea is warm. It is, it is an incredibly beautiful country. But... It was barren, and the Boers built it into a powerhouse. They, they produced food for almost the whole of Africa. They, they 
what came out of South Africa is incredible. Thinking of the small population and, and the, the problems that they were suffering. They did an incredible, incredible, huge job. But the uncivilized blacks who had never been introduced to this kind of way of life wanted a part of it. Now, there were not enough whites to do all the work that was required to build this country up. So we hired them in the mines and building streets, doing the work. We needed them because there were not enough whites to do that. And they were being paid a decent wage. And the, the Africana uh, nation has always been very, uh, a very patriarchal nation. So if you had a black servant, they were kind of your child. You had to look after them. So on the farms, they were given homes. They were given food. They were given medical care. And they were given a small salary as well at the end of the month. And they were part of the family as such. The, 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 the Boer patriarch took responsibility for their health, their welfare, their studies, their everything. And there was work for everybody. And everybody was doing quite well. Thank you very much. <laughs> so that, that little... Oh, and, and I have to tell you as well that Afrikaans is one of only three languages which has been... A declared a modern language and accepted as a language in the last couple of centuries. It is one of only three uh, languages that have been accepted as a real language. So the Afrikaner and Afrikaans are a tribe of people with their own internationally accepted language. Mm -hmm. They are not just some little white tribe that are out there to murder, kill, destroy, and, and steal. Right. Yep. And then I need to say this as well, because during the apartheid era, it was said that the whites were slaughtering blacks by their hundreds of thousands. That is an absolutely untrue piece of nonsense. During the 40, 50 years of the apartheid regime, there were an average of 7,036 murders per year recorded in South Africa. And since then, that murder rate has gone up to 135,000 plus per year because one can never get a real figure of how many there really are. So, 7,000 a year, and that included black on black murders. That was not uh, white on black, it was black on black murders. So, the story that, that apartheid had to come to an end because these terrible Boers were killing the blacks by their hundreds of thousands is also absolute nonsense. And those figures can be looked up because they set up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission when they ended apartheid, and the blacks themselves put those figures out of 7,000 per year every mm -hmm. death. Right. So that is another story that really needs to be hit on the head because it is not true. Yeah, I definitely want to talk more about that here. But let's let's just kind of run through a little bit of how how this came to an end, basically, and some of the political interests behind this. We have, of course... A, uh, we linked up a video recently of how these very proud white British people were talking about how they were helping to to ship in uh, guns oh. in this bus or the truck, whatever. Oh. I, for, I forget the name, what it was called, but it was a very, very, very interesting to see the mentality of these people, how, how self-righteous they were that they had helped to bring this horrible political system down. But tell us about the ANC. Tell us about... Joe Slovo, tell us about the the the, the communist uh, faction to this of, of of what you think was the political interest uh, part of bringing down the system that was uh, that had been set up by the British and then handed down to the the Boer. Well, uh, yeah, that that is a whole different story. So we need to start with the icon, this icon of peace who has statues all over the world and who everybody worships as if he were a god, Nelson Mandela. Right. Because that is the one South African that everybody knows about. And um, everybody has got a very, very, very wrong impression about that man. So Nelson Mandela is a, a vendor and he grew up in South Africa. And he became a lawyer under the, this terrible oppressive apartheid regime where he got an education and became a lawyer. I don't, I, I don't want to speak to how he became politically involved with anything, 
that he was a terrible, terrible man. He was a communist. His agenda was to slaughter as many whites as possible and to take the country over for his black brethren. Now, when, when he was taken to court, and this you can Google as well because the entire transcript of his trial is available online. He was accused of 156 plus crimes of murder, treason, and uh, traitorous acts. And he pleaded guilty. He, he had pleaded guilty to 156 of those charges against him. So he didn't even contest them. And when they went to, to um, investigate what arms and ammunition he had, this man was responsible for warehouses full of limpet mines, grenades, etc., etc. So his agenda was definitely not a bush war. It was a war on the white civilian population. That is what he intended. And he is directly responsible for thousands upon thousands of white deaths where the ANC bombed restaurants, um, uh, um, police stations, train stations, etc. He was directly responsible for that because he was the founder of the armed wing of the ANC, which is called MK, and he arranged for them to be trained by the Cubans and the Russians in the countries surrounding South Africa. Now, mainly in Angola, they were which borders onto Southwest Africa, now Namibia. They were being trained by Cubans and Russians. A lot of the ex black exiles from South Africa were sent to Russia to the Patrice Mumumba University there, and uh, they were trained in in terrorist tactics there as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know what kind of degrees they actually got there, but I know they came back fully fully trained terrorists. So our white boys in South Africa during those years. There was conscri conscription in place, and after school, they had to serve either two or three years in the army, and then do a month to three months army camps every year in perpetuity after that, until such time as they were not needed. So all three of my brothers uh, fought the Angolan War on the borders of uh, Southwest Africa. And now many of our guys were killed in that war, maimed. Um, legs blown off as in every war, those kind of things happen. And it's important to note the absolute alliance of the ANC with communist Cuba and communist Russia at that time. Mm -hmm. So we were fighting war wars on, on all our borders. And at the same time, the rest of the world, uh, for political reasons best known to themselves, uh, I think it was a, a, a once more, the money in South Africa and the riches of South Africa and the mineral rights in South Africa came into play. And the USA, um, Britain, most European countries formed an alliance and put sanctions, very, very, very strict sanctions against South Africa. So we could not get anything from the outside world. And the Boers, being their very creative, very incredible people, they just said, okay, well, we're not going to lie down and die because of this. We'll do it ourselves. So there are many things that we did during those years. Our arm school, which was our, our research and development uh, arm of the military things, they created helicopters and uh, staff transport and tanks and guns and all kinds of oh, airplanes as well which the rest of the world uh, bypassed sanctions, especially France. They bypassed the sanctions upon South Africa in order to get their hands on this incredible um, modern weaponry that had been developed and made in South Africa. Uh, we did the first heart transplant in the world, which is a little aside since mm -hmm. the ANC have taken over. A black guy who worked in the operating theaters with Chris Barnard, who did the first operation, has now claimed the credit for doing that operation. Hmm. Um, so they're trying to take even that away from the whites in South Africa, but that's just a little, a little aside. It's not that important. Um, we didn't have, we did not have 
gas, petrol, as I've already said. Right. So, and we needed it desperately because you cannot run a country or an army without that. So what the Boers did, we have an overabundance of coal. So they discovered a way to make petrol out of coal. And that was how Sassel, one of the enormous powerhouse industries in South Africa, was formed. Um, under duress from the rest of the world, we said, okay, watch this and created everything we needed for ourselves. But it is very hard for a, a country which is supporting all these black tribes in their own homelands on a very small taxpayer base and doing no business or commerce with anyone else in the world. It is very hard for them to have available money because where are you getting from? You're recycling that taxpayer's money all the time. It's not coming from anywhere else. So yeah, no, no one was, was trading with you and everything was, no. was cut off to you and yeah. No, we, we, we had no foreign uh, uh, money coming in. So the money that was in the country was being recycled and recycled and recycled, but there was, there was no room for, for growth, as it were. So we were under siege because we were fighting wars on our borders. We were under siege because the, the world hated us. We were under incredible media hatred, yes. absolute hatred. We became ashamed to be white, to be South African. We, we couldn't compete internationally in any sports. We couldn't, we, we couldn't have technology or music or anything. I mean, they were doing concerts where they were wa waving their lighters in the air and, and swearing blind they would never come and play in South Africa. So we didn't have any contact with the outside world. And I think we were stagnating. But that's a personal opinion. Right. But I do feel we were stagnating because we were cut off. We were a little country all on our own, um, left to our own devices, and the only people that we had interaction with were ourselves. So it was so, it was basically like a you you were hated, um, and we'll get in more detail to this. But basically, because you were trying to do something which was going completely against the the narrative of the times of moving towards you know globalism and and multiculturalism, and it has to be just in this particular way. Uh -huh. uh, and you guys were doing it in. Uh, you know, keep keep doing what what uh, you know you inherited from the British, basically. And this is I mean, how what, what what do people need to know about the conditions at the time of what existed? I mean, as you said, we, we, there was incredible um, you know propaganda in the media that there was murders committed by uh, by whites against blacks, and there was like a, a horrible oppression and all. Is is is, is any of that true? Um, Hendrik, I would say some of it is true. That, that I will explain that to you. As I said to you, the murder rate was 7,000 7, per annum. And that was mainly black-on-black -black murder. Um, White-on-black murder was practically unheard of. We did have a repressive government because they were so forced into controlling everything. They had to in order to keep a grip on the situation. But it began going south, I think, in 1976, when the Soweto riots happened. Now, these black children were living in a, in a poor suburb, which was a, a black suburb. Soweto has always been a black suburb, mm. um, in a white area, in, in Johannesburg. So it was in a white city, but on the outskirts of the city. Now, they had schools, and they didn't want to be taught in Afrikaans. They wanted to be taught in their own languages. Now, you have to understand that even today, there are no school books written in Zulu and Kosa and Venda and Sotu, and there are no school books written in those languages. So they demanded that they be taught in their own language. Now, when the blacks riot in South Africa from, from days of old to up to today, they go really crazy. They burn things, they loot, they break, they stone cars, they kill each other. They, they, are, they revert to barbarism when they, when they riot. So these um, rioters put the school children in front of the, the march and set out to burn and destroy everything in sight. So the police were obviously called in and it became an absolute disaster because the defense force was called in and some black children were killed. And that was the beginning of the awful, 
awful press and the awful struggles for the white South Africans. Now, I suppose it could have been handled better, but you have to remember that that South Africa was at war on all our borders. We were not officially at war internally, but we were having bombs uh, exploded in, in, in our suburbs, in our restaurants. Um, it was a war zone. Mm. So the South African government used war uh, tactics on this riot. Well, those pictures of that black school kid that was killed went viral. They went all over the world. And the world turned on us and said, okay, you people are killing children. You're not just killing blacks now. You are killing children. Right. And you are beyond the pale. We are going to destroy you. Yeah. If you do not stop, we will destroy you. So when the um, – under Ronald Reagan in the 80s, I think it was um, – the Congress here had a vote to institute severe sanctions against South Africa, which uh, Ronald Reagan vetoed, and they overcame his veto. So then some really severe sanctions were instituted, and we started, we started battling. But the slaughter of the blacks is not a true thing at all, because throughout the history of South Africa, the major crime is black on black to this day. The major crime is black on black. And in into some figures that I looked at the other day, there has been absolutely zero, zero white on black rape this year or in previous years, and maybe five white on black murders in the past three years. So you cannot say that the whites are these murderous, awful people who are just there to be white nationalists and, and wipe out the black population. It is just not, history does not support that view of life. Well, I, I think that as a microcosm is, is kind of, to a certain extent, something we're, we're moving into. I, I want people to put that in perspective. But, but this aspect that we no longer are in a world where we basically can go somewhere and create something and build something and set that up for ourselves. And, and also then consequently that the building of those things um, we do for our own as an incentive to create something. We're, we're, we're in that environment now. Basically, you didn't build that. You didn't create that. And whatever you did, if you actually achieved it, it was obviously on the backs of someone else or you stole it. And therefore, you know, you need to share it with everyone. And I mean, to a certain extent, that's I mean, not as severe, of course, but that's kind of what's happening in starting to happen in, in Europe right now, where we are beginning to, uh, it, we can no longer just basically create something for ourselves and, and hold it and keep it. It's somehow something we have to share with the rest of the world, right? Well, you know, Henrik, what I say is this. The, the, the black Africa threw out the colonialists, the settlers. They threw them all out of every country. And now they have reduced those countries to to the dark ages. There is nothing left of what the whites created there. And where are the blacks going now? They are, infil well, not even infiltrating because they are flooding in by their hundreds of thousands to those self same white countries that they hate so much. Right. But do they go there to, to integrate, to contribute, to do a single damn thing that's good for the country? No. They are going there to turn that country into the same wasteland that they've turned their own countries into. Yeah. So, so does it make any sense? And if we stand up and say anything, we are racist, we are Islamophobes, we are, we, we are horrible people. Yeah. So we're not allowed to defend ourselves even verbally against this onslaught on our beliefs, our values, our things. Let's take that in the opposite extreme direction. What what do we need to do to, let's say, please others? And and so we can't work for ourselves. We can't build something up and, and create it for ourselves. Obviously, it needs to be shared or something. But I mean, when when will when will there be a a, a situation where the the opposition here is satisfied, if you will? <laughs> when will they when will they say, oh, this is a good situation. Let's let's keep it at that and let's work together. I mean, is that ever going to happen? The, and Henrik, this is once more just my own opinion. I, I could be very wrong. I don't have any, any facts and figures to back it up with. But my opinion is that they want the entire world to be coffee-colored 
um, to be no more whites, um, to to dumb us down to the lowest common denominator, because equality, to me, I've watched it all over the world, equality does not mean lifting up the bottom people. It means bringing the top people down yeah. to the common denominator of the lowest level of intelligence, of, of education, of creativity, of uh, decency, of morality. We all have to come down to the lowest level and sink into the sewers of the world and then maybe it'll all be equal and all be good enough. Yeah, equally, uh, equally uh, miserable, I guess. Yes, yes, yeah. I, and and it disturbs me terribly that that the incredible things that have been created, done, found, music, literature, art, all of those things have no value in that world. So. We are going back into the dark ages. Yeah. Let me ask you a little bit about uh, some of the things that have been occurring now then in, in South Africa and, and what, the, what, what, what things are like today and, and what, um, what all the things that we don't hear about, basically. I mean, what, one of the things that's been ongoing for many years now is the, the tearing down of those who did build the country into what it is, the... the uh, you know, parks are renamed, schools are changed named, the statues are torn down, all of these things are happening. I think the most recent one is the Cecil Rhodes statue was, was taken down and everyone was was cheering, of course, to to that. But how are things today? What's happening on the street level for, for average people in South Africa? Henrik, that, that is a huge subject, but, but I, I need to preface it by saying that all the changes that have happened in South Africa did not happen overnight. So they crept up on us. Where once we were a nation of friendly, hospitable, kind, caring people, what happened was the crime got bigger, so you had to build a wall around your house, which meant you were no longer able to see or talk to your neighbors. The crime got worse, so you put electric wiring on top of the eight-foot wall around your house. The crime got worse, so you put in an alarm system connected to an alarm company. You barred all your windows. You, uh, man, but the first thing that ANC did in 1994 was to disarm the white populace. So I told you about our identity books where you had to have your firearm licenses in your identity box. So your firearms were all licensed, and the government had a list, a register of who owned what. So when the ANC took over in 1994, one of their first things that they did was to confiscate firearms. And there was no way you could say you didn't have them because they had a record of them. Now, it was put to you that it was on a sort of voluntary basis, but if your name began, your surname began with an A, then you had to have handed in by the state, etc. Now, South Africans are a very law-abiding nation of people, and most of them went and handed their firearms in at the nearest police station on the promise that they could then apply for a new firearm license under the ANC rules and they would get their firearm back at a later stage once they had a license. Well, people went by their thousands to apply for these firearm licenses. It is 21 years into ANC rule and there are people still waiting from the beginning in 1995 to now to get that license back. So these firearms are stacked in, in strong rooms in police stations all over the country and the police themselves are selling them to criminals or hiring them out by the day to criminals while you wait for your license so your firearm is being used to kill you thanks to the local police station so that's one of the things that happened in South Africa now as a direct result of that you cannot defend yourself so you put up all these warm walls and, and systems and everything to protect yourself, hopefully. But the law is, is, is in such a way that if a black man breaks in through the roof of your house at 3 o'clock in the morning and you kill him, you will be arrested for murder. All he has to say is he's looking for work and you may not touch him. Now, there's another thing that happens in South Africa, which, which to me is a terrible thing. 
if you are on vacation and your house is vacant and a black breaks into your house and takes possession of it, if he has been there for more than 48 hours, when you come back from vacation, you then have to go to the Supreme Court through a whole bunch of smaller courts, but eventually get to the Supreme Court in order to get your house back from the black squatter who has taken over your house. Now, he doesn't have to defend himself. He has no legal fees. He has no problem. He just has to sit in your house. And the longer he's there, the more right he has to it. While you go through this entire um, bank, bank balance destroying process to try and get your property back from this black squatter. So that is another thing that has changed in South Africa. And I saw it in a house next door to me when I still lived in South Africa, this house was taken over by squatters. They then connected their electricity lines illegally to mine, so I was paying for their power. They connected their water to my water lines, so I was paying for their water. And I complained until I was purple in the face and nothing was done about it. But if I was one day late paying my bills, they would switch it off. So there's another thing that is incredibly unfair in that country that you, they will do nothing against the blacks who are stealing from the government and stealing from the whites, but they will penalize the whites for it. These same people living as squatters in that house, they made my life an absolute terrible situation. I was a single mom with a teenage daughter. They made our lives an absolute misery. They broke into our house, I don't know how many times. They had parties all night. And when you called the police, the police would come and threaten me, not them. And, uh, it's it's a microcosm that a very small thing because it, it really is a small thing in anybody's life, but it, it's a small picture of what is the bigger picture in South Africa today. Well, we're going to take a break in a little bit here, but I wanted to squeeze in one more question before we do that. Do you think that there is a, an appetite for revenge by the people who run the country, run the ANC, and obviously those who vote for them? That somehow there has to be a a payment here yielded for for the the history that they have been told happened to them and to their people? Absolutely. Uh, There is no question about that, Henrik. When the president of the country, now let me describe our president to you. He was a goat herd who looked after his father's goats. He never had any, any official schooling whatsoever. He was taught by a a person who had a grade five level, he was taught to read and write, but he never went to school. Now, this man rules the country. He has had six wives. He now has four that I know of. One died and one was when he divorced. So he has four wives. And even he himself tells you he has got 20 plus children. He can't tell you how many he has got. This man, when he was elected president, had something like 700 charges against him of fraud, of rape, of all kinds of things, which have since been swept under the rug, and he is president. Now, when when he was accused of raping one of his aides, who had aides, just by the way, he told the world that he took a shower the following morning, so therefore he can't have aides and everything's fine. And thus he earned his nickname, Showerhead. Um, But the the appetite for revenge on the whites is definitely there because before Parliament, he sings a song called Machiniwa, which means bring me my machine gun. Now, the song says, bring me my machine gun. We will shoot the whites. We will drive them into the sea. The Congress will drive them into the sea. Now, when he was taken to the Human Rights Court for singing that song, his defense was it was a freedom fighter song and that it was perfectly okay to sing it because it was traditional. Now, in their tradition, they do not have a Congress. So the words of the song absolutely tell that he's telling a lie about it being a traditional song because they don't have Congress. However, he was told to stop singing the song, but has refused to do it. He sang it in front of Obama uh, while Obama stood next to him with a big smile on his face. Now, they also sing a song called Kill the Boer, and uh, the opposition party of the economic freedom fighters, Julius Malema, who we'll get to at another time, he sings that song. Now, he was also taken to human rights court and told to stop singing it. So now he says, well, he sings Kiss the Boer, which is not the same song at all, and so he can sing it any time he wishes. But every time either of those two go in public and sing that song, there's a sudden upsurge in the murders of the whites. 
Now, they have a vested interest in, in making uh, the, the whites the hatred, hated people because the internal warring between the tribes in South Africa has never stopped. They hate each other. So if they did not have a common enemy, the whites, that keeps them held together, they would be turning on each other, which not, would not be a good story for the ANC government. So yes, they have a vested interest in, in stirring up hatred of the white people. Oh boy. Well, we have much more to discuss here. We're going to pick up in a little bit. I, I heard that the EFF, the Economic Freedom Fighters, were even, I think they were like even more extreme than the ANC. They were like complaining on them for being weak and not doing enough, right? Isn't that right? They, they're, they're a newcomer yes, on the block, yes, right? Yes. And they, they are the future of South Africa and the fear of every white person in South Africa. Because the leader of the EFF is Julius Malema, Malema, who was the ANC youth leader. Now, he helped to ask the original, the, the, the second president of South Africa, his name was Mbeki, he helped to get rid of him and put Zuma into power. Now, when Zuma was in power, the ANC Youth League and Zuma came, came to blows with each other. And um, Julius Malema was ousted from the leadership of the ANC Youth Leadership and he was then suspended from the ANC party altogether. So he then went and formed his own party, the Economic Freedom Fighters. Now Julius Malema is a young man with an equal education to our illustrious president. He failed woodwork at school did Julius, so you understand how intelligent he is, and uh, he formed this party. Now, you need to understand that under the ANC government, the black youth unemployment figures are over 50%. So Malema has got this entire disenfranchised, disenchanted, angry a group of, of young people on his side. You would think that the blacks would see that the watch that Malema wears is more than they will earn in a lifetime, that his mansions, his cars, his everything, you, you would think that they would see that as a bad thing, but they do not. They see him as a symbol of the opportunity for the black youth, that if they just stand up and shout loud enough, they can be Julius Malema. Now, Malema is a great admirer of Robert Mugabe. Mm. No, also known as Mad Bob Mugabe, oh, yeah. Crazy. the president of Zimbabwe, who has slaughtered whites and his own people at a rate not seen in Africa for a very long time. He has reduced his country to an absolute poverty-stricken, hopeless, helpless, not even third world. I don't know what I would call it. But he is still in power. Yeah. Uh, Malema admires Mugabe greatly and goes to him for advice and gives him advice. So when Malema um, was um, campaigning for his party for the last elections, his banner said uh, that the honeymoon is over for the white people in South Africa. Now he subsequently come out and said that the whites have a place in South Africa and he's not going to chase them out. But with the next breath, he says, that we must take all white land away. Whites own too much land. It must be taken away from them. We must nationalize the mines, the banks, the building societies, the insurance companies. Everything must be nationalized and belong to the people. And if he comes into power, that's what he intends to do. Well, you guys are not a protected minority as, uh, you know, we, we hear in Europe that we have to protect other minorities. Like, the, In fact, we are actually bypassed in terms of some legal rights um, favorable to minorities over our own. And, uh, you know, on a world scene, we, we, we actually are the minority. But we, we have much more to talk about, and we'll pick up here in a little bit. I just want you to mention some of your websites where people can go to find out more of the, of the, the work that you're doing and trying to raise awareness about this. And, and please uh, give out some of the sources where people can go, Karen. There are a, a huge number of websites about South Africa. But um, there is a Dutch journalist, um, her name is Ariana State, and she was a journalist in South Africa who has subsequently gone back to Holland. Now, she has campaigned tirelessly for the whites in South Africa, and she has a website called Sensa Bugbear. Sensa, as in censorship, and Bugbear. She has the most up-to-date, most verifiable figures, numbers uh, of the deaths, white deaths in South Africa. So her website is invaluable. 
There is one, but you need a very, very strong stomach to go to this website because they have got pictures of the actual murders, the rapes, the, the torture inflicted on the white South Africans. It is called Afrikaner Genocide Museum. One of the useful things on their website is that they have got over 70,000 documented white murders by date, by name, and by what happened to them. It's about 650 printable pages of the murders against the whites in South Africa. But I would warn you again that it is a very disturbing sight because the, what is done, the torture inflicted on the whites before they are killed is horrific. Yeah. Uh, there, there is um, uh, Mike Smith's political commentary is a fantastic site, very informative. He has written a series of articles that are called Opening Pandora's Box, which are a history of South Africa and an absolute documentary of what has happened in South Africa from the beginning to today. That is invaluable reading. It's a long read because he updates it all the time. But if you really want to know what's happening in South Africa, he writes fantastically well about it. Um, I am on Radio Free South Africa on three channels, three times a week. Unfortunately, I have not had time yet to put up a web page. I've done nine radio shows this week, so you understand that I'm a little bit overwhelmed and inundated at the moment because I am a disabled grandmother and... Uh, trying to run my life at the same time as defend three and a half million lives in South Africa. So I'm trying to get a website of my own put up, but it, it, it's, a, it's some time in the future. So that, that's, those are the best websites I can direct you to if you want to know about the squatter camps in South Africa. There is a, a South African charity, which is my charity of choice, where I know every penny actually goes to the poor whites in South Africa. It is the South African Family Relief Project, S-A-F-R-P, South African Family Relief Project, S-A.org. They have got pictures of the squatter camps. They have got pictures of the absolute horrible circumstances that the whites are living in today. All right. Uh, a couple of good websites there, folks, for you to uh, check out. We're going to have the links up to this, of course, but do check out S-A-F-R-P-S-A.org. That's uh, one, of the, one of the main websites mentioned here, and, of course, uh, the other links we'll have up, but uh, much more to discuss. Stay with us, Karen, and uh, we'll return shortly after a break. Thank you for joining us here in the second segment. We're speaking together with Karen Smith about South Africa and how the white European people have been treated in that country since the end of apartheid. And, and of course, we've been going through some of the history as well. And there's a, it's, a, it's a massive subject. There's so many different components to it. There's so many different facets, and it's uh, challenging to piece it all together, but uh, Karen is doing a great job explaining the background to us here so that we can understand why things are the way they are and, and, and how it came to this place and position. But one thing I wanted to ask you about is that, you know, there certainly is a lot of problems in the world. There's no denying that. And I'm not trying to in any way put down what's happening in South Africa. In fact, quite the opposite. This is a very unique situation when it comes to the the horrible atrocities that have occurred in that country. But as the rest of the world is concerned, we've heard plenty of various problems that occurs in various countries and, and basically genocides in different forms or when a government targets its people in different things. But for some reason, this is largely being kept out of the media. And and, and it's it's funny to to hear as well, well, not funny, but it's uh, it's ironic that the, the behavior that, uh, you know, they claimed uh, that you uh, Europeans subjected um, the uh, black South Africans to is something that they subject you to now. And and why is this not being brought up in the media? Why is no one recognizing this and, and talking about this? Because every time it comes up, then you get charged with all these, uh, you know, words and whatnot, that you're the hater and you're the one that's ignorant of history. And I mean, there certainly is a is a battle ongoing in terms of the information war on top of everything that's happening, Karen. Well, that, that is an, uh, a question that I've asked every South African. And as far as, okay, uh, the opinion, general opinion is that the world cannot admit they made a mistake. So they were so anti, vocally anti-white South Africa that they cannot turn around and say that, well, that was a terrible mistake we made and we need to fix it. Um, 
that that's very simplistic, I think. But at the same time, it's also true. And I, I, my opinion, and again, I say I do not have much to back this up. In my opinion, it is an experiment to see whether they can annihilate the whites in a country without the rest of the world paying attention. And so far, it is working perfectly because there is not uh, any mainstream media reports anywhere in the world on what is happening to the whites in South Africa. Now, when I came to America four, just over four years ago, I expected the news and the, the, the newspapers and everything to be full of this terrible things that were happening in South Africa. But the only things I ever heard about South Africa were Nelson Mandela and uh, the Oscar Pistorius trial and some things about Charlize Theron, who's a famous actress in, in America. But nothing, nothing, a silence about what the reality is of life in South Africa. So I got very taken aback by this. And although I, I have no background whatsoever in media or in public speaking or in anything uh, related to that, I started contacting radio stations and saying, look, you know, you've got so much sympathy for these black people. You, the churches in America are all sending aid to the blacks in South Africa. And, and I just said, now look here, you know, the whites need help as well. And so for every 20 doors that got slammed in my face, one would open a little crack and I would go on air and say my story. And, um, but, but for the rest, the media is dead silent. Now we have a group of people who write to politicians throughout the world. Once a week, we send them emails with the latest updates on South Africa. To this day, I have had not one response from anybody in Congress in the USA. Mm. Not one person has even acknowledged my existence, much less that they are listening to what we have to say. However, there are a couple of articles in um, American journals today. The New Observer has an article today about truth and lies about South African history. Blacks are not indigenous and arrived at the same time as whites. So that is a really big thing because I've never seen anything like that before. And then in the National Review, they have had a couple of articles. One, white South Africans are in grave danger. There may be a solution. Um, and the Mail and Guardian, which often does South African things, but it, it also is published, some of it in South Africa, talking about politics results in filthy water. So, and there's another one in Prague.org, which is a friend of mine, Dan Root, Dr. Dan Root. He is a South African activist who has been treated shabbily by the government because he speaks out. His website is prag.org. He writes, South Africa is sleepwalking into disaster. So, yes, there is a slight awakening happening, but I also think because of people's, because every country in the world is in a mess right now, and right. That, is, that is the truth. The people are so busy trying to survive and, and to make their own way in life and to take care of their own selves and their own families. They do not have the attention span or the money or even the compassion, really, to care about a country so far away that most of them couldn't even uh, put their finger on it on a map. So why should they care about the small white race in South Africa being annihilated? They should care because they are seeing now that if they had paid attention for the last 20 years to what was going on in South Africa, they might have had a better idea of how to stop it in their own countries. But they turned a blind eye to it and now they have it in their own country. Sweden has got incredible black and white, white uh, rape statistics. Incredible. The USA, I read today, 30% of the crime committed in the USA is by illegal aliens. Yeah. Um, if you look at Spain, um, Belgium, they are being overrun, absolutely overrun by these hundreds of thousands of refugees from Africa. Now, if they had been paying attention and if the media had let them know what was happening in South Africa, they might have been more prepared. So for me, it's an experiment in seeing whether it will work. Uh, killing off the white race in South Africa, and it is working. Yeah, it's it's absolutely horrible. I mean, let, let's face it. I mean, this this behavior would never be 
accepted acceptable if the if the roles if the, if the players involved if you will were were swapped yeah. out i mean we we would heard about this day and night but for some reason whenever it's whites on the receiving end of of brutality and horror and atrocities largely nothing is nothing is ever said because i mean there is this undertone within that comes from the university world of of cultural marxism and all these people that are basically seeing uh whites i i guess to a certain extent then they they are so shallow that they just take it on the skin color level but that whites somehow rep- they represent an oppressive force so whatever <laughs> whatever happens to us we we deserve it it doesn't matter if we have a person growing up today a young child a, a girl who's three years old who had nothing to do with any of this previous political debacle that's been going on or or uh, wars back and forth or atrocities but somehow her behavior of being mistreated because of who she is, uh, that somehow is still okay, isn't it? Well, it seems to me that I don't know, I don't know what you would call them, but for me, the elites, the, the oligarchy who rule this world, and they, they're a handful of them, they have made us so ashamed of being who we are. Now, you can have black pride, you can have uh, Hispanic pride, you can have Chinese pride, you can have green Martian pride. It doesn't matter. That's fine. But the minute you have white pride or, or anything, mention white, and immediately you have all these terrible isms thrown against you. Why do we have no right to be proud? We are proud. We created the Western world. We created Western civilization. We created cars, telephones, computers, the internet, um, music, art, language, books, we created that. Do we not have a right to be proud? Yeah. And yet we don't. We don't. We're not allowed to. Yeah. And I don't understand it, Henrik. I don't understand it. I. I it's, I just, it's, it's a political, um, well, there's many things I, th- I think personally behind it, but I, I think there is a, I think that there is a desire to, to basically subjugate the majority of the of the different people under uh, one one rule of of the planet, world government, all these kinds of things, and I think in their in their idea that for various reasons, um, whites have have Europeans have popped out and done things that are too unpredictable. If we look back in the uh-huh. history, uh-huh. things that are of technological development that could stand in the way of of the the oligarchs, as you say, and I think that. To a certain extent, it's it's they're seen as an enemy that could oppose and resist uh, the plans of of what they have for us. And I think that therefore, a, an active way of of taking care of this is to make sure that we lose pride in ourselves, so we are more than happy to basically end and terminate our own lines, even if that uh, comes to not having any children at all and and just focusing on our you know careers, or if that's basically about. Um, not preserving your people and 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 uh, mixing with someone else and and making sure that uh, you know your your line and that your 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 parents line and and end with you basically and and it's so there's a number of diff- different ways that this is being done but I don't think there is any accident that you know our our countries are being completely invaded by immig- immigration we are being um, shamed and and uh, guilt tripped in the media and then when atrocities do occur. None of it is being brought up in the media or recognized of it. And, and of course, we have to ask the question of wonder of who, who, who runs the media in this way that they basically manage to keep everything out. It's basically just independent media that managed to, to raise awareness about these atrocities that are ongoing. Um, I, I heard a very good theory of that the other day. Ken of DailyKen.com. He said that the depopulation of the world, you know that the, the, the New World Order wants to wipe out most of the population of the Earth because we are too many. And he said that they cannot do it while the whites are there because the whites are the ones who have created um, medical medical miracles that keep people alive. So while the whites are there and going to do these unexpected things that you've just said, they will get in the way of depopulating the Earth. So they have to get rid of them first before they can get rid of the rest of them now you don't have to subscribe to that theory but it's a very interesting theory yeah yeah i agree there's some some reason there that they're targeting us specifically first as well and it's it's an experiment i guess too uh, um to to see what the, but surely the the reaction to this is not 
just going to be that we're going to lay down and give up and die. I mean, let, let's go back to South Africa a little bit and, and talk about what is the, the Afrikaner, the white European population there now? Is it about two and a half million people? Do you know? Uh, well, you know, I need to tell you this as well. Getting any figures out of South Africa is extremely difficult because there is unbelievable censorship there. Right. And um, the government has, does not allow the newspapers or anybody to put out crime figures, for instance. The government puts them out. When, if and when they feel like them. So approximately every 18 months, they will bring out crime statistics, but they are not split up into racial groups. So uh, although the crime statistics are not even true, because we can prove with the documented murders that we've got that they're reporting nonsense, get any figure out of South Africa is difficult. So as far as I know, there are approximately 3.5 million white people out of a population of between 55 and 70 million. And you know what I saw recently, uh, it just came to me now, I recall that, I forget which city it was in, but it was in South Africa, and uh, due to the harsh economic conditions in some of the other neighboring countries, there were other other blacks from other parts of Africa that were coming into South Africa, and there was has been this horrible, obviously, crime, uh, you know, because of this, where they begin to, you know, target other uh, other Africans from other countries that come down. And in this instance, it was all over the Daily Mail in the UK, you know, the Telegraph wrote about it, CNN and all these things. So I guess in certain instances, depending on the skin color of the uh, of the victims, it does actually come to the surface, I guess. Well, I, I, this for me is, is one of the biggest shocks. You know, the whole media uproar worldwide about Cecil the Lion. Yes. Now, in that period that they have been screaming and shouting about Cecil the Lion, 58 white South Africans have been tortured to death. And not one word. No. It's not so, important. They, they no, don't care about it, you know? But, but how is that possible? Henrik, my heart breaks to see that the lion who the Zimbabweans don't care one bit about. They really don't because it was Zimbabwean came out on on an article the other day and said, "Oh, for heaven's sake, we kill lions every day," and 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 Mad Bob Mugabe had two lions on his birthday menu. I know an elephant and all these things. Amazing! Yes. Wow. Yes. So this whole uproar created by the rest of the world, while fifty eight innocent white South Africans were tortured and raped to death, and not one word. No. I I. You know, I just want to give up most days. I want to sit here in my little house and say, look, I'm not achieving anything. My voice is not being heard. I, I, but I feel the pressure of those three and a half million lives on my shoulders because I'm the only one in the USA trying to do this. The only one person in the whole of the USA trying to raise awareness. And so I feel the weight of those people who are dying like flies. And they're being targeted for for who they are. It's, it, is this, do you think, Karen, done in a, I mean, what's feeding this? Is is there a, what can you tell us about the media climate in South Africa? Are there, are there papers and television shows that come out that, that speak about this? I mean, is it, no, is it? No, Henrik. You know, in South Africa, the, the, the press is controlled by the government and the radio stations and the uh, TV stations are government owned. So there is intense censorship. But if crime, any crime, is reported in the newspapers, it will always have a picture of white hands in handcuffs. Always. And yet there is very little white on black or white on white crime in South Africa. So they are brainwashing you just by that picture of thinking that that story is about some white criminal. And so, yes, it is orchestrated from the top downwards. And it, it, it is a terrible thing. I, I would like to talk to you about squatter camps in South Africa, because this is, a, the, this is a story that the world needs to know, and they need to pay attention. So there are 119 plus race-based laws in South Africa. Now, in the Constitution of South Africa, which has been held up in the American Congress as the best constitution in the world, better than the American one, it says that there will be no discrimination by means of color, race, sexual preference, etc. And a couple of paragraphs later, it says, except 
in the case of affirmative action, which is to right the wrongs of the past. So our constitution itself contradicts itself in one breath. Now, when the blacks came into power, they instituted affirmative action laws. And um, your company had to have, have a staff contingent that equaled the demographics of the country. Now, the demographics of the country are 90% black, a couple of percent Indian, a couple of percent other colors, and about, about 6% white, or 6 or 7%, depending on which figures you're looking at. So if your company has more than 6% white people, you will be penalized by the government. Mm. Now, originally, white women were categorized as previously disadvantaged people. So if, if a company was hiring, they would hire a white woman because they still met the, the standards set by the government. So if a man was laid off from his job because he was white, his wife had a good chance of getting a job. So we were still hobbling along quite nicely. But then they decided that white women were no longer previously disadvantaged. And then they instituted black economic empowerment laws. It has now got to broad-based black economic empowerment. And there were some new laws passed earlier this year. So the number of racist anti-white laws in South Africa is probably well over the 119 that I know about. So how, what country in the world has 119 laws protecting the huge majority from the tiny minority? Yeah. It's, it's just insane. It's mind-boggling. It is totally insane. So what they've been doing is um, a couple of years back, they, they said that you have a BEE scorecard if you have a company, which means at the end of every month, the government looks at your scorecard and sees how many blacks are in management level. So you must have 90% black management, 90% black middle management, 90% black ordinary workers, etc. Otherwise, you cannot get a government contract. So not only you, but any of your suppliers. So if you're a printer, your paper supplier, your ink supplier, your, your everything has to be BBBEEE compliant. Yeah. And if they're not, you cannot get a government contract. So they've started laying off whites at a rate of knots. I mean, if you were white, you were out of a job. End of story. That, that, that's just it. So, oh, and, and I need to mention there as well that charity giving is scored on that same scorecard. So if you give to anything other than 100% black charity, you lose points on that scorecard. So if your, <laughs> if your orphanage has got 5% whites, you will lose points. Mm. Right. So now they've cut off the job market for the whites, and they've cut off all charity giving for the whites. Wow. Talk about so, micromanagement. Wow. Yes. Yes. Even the Red Cross. Now, um, one of the guys from American White History Month contacted the Red Cross in America and asked them why are they not helping the whites in South Africa. And the answer that he was given was that the government has said that the Red Cross cannot function at all in South Africa if they are seen to be helping whites. So in order to have a presence in South Africa, they help only blacks. Right. Now, that doesn't sound so bad. It doesn't sound so bad. But you have to consider this, that out of a population of 3.5 million whites, 1 million and counting are jobless, homeless, and living in informal settlements. Yeah. Now, they have no access to money, charity, food, social services, hospitals, nothing. They have access to absolutely nothing. It's amazing. And, and, and this is something that the world needs to know about. Yes. There was an informal settlement in South Africa that had been there for about 14 years. It was called Coronation Woodville. It was a white informal settlement where, and now people call them squatter camps, but that gives a totally wrong impression of what they are. Because the, squatter, the black squatter camps are where blacks have just taken over a piece of land 
uh, that doesn't belong to them and put up shacks and shanties there. The whites have been given land by some sympathetic white farmer person, whoever, has given them a piece of land and said, okay, you can come and live here because you have nowhere else to live except on the side of the road. Because these people who are middle class or upper class have lost their jobs, therefore lost their homes, lost their cars, lost everything. Their kids who were at good schools cannot go to school anymore, and they had nowhere to live. So a lot of them were living on the side of highways under makeshift shelters. So they, a sad thing about South Africa is that a white person feels honored to live in one of these informal settlements because they at least have some safety in numbers there. Anyway, yeah. so Coronationville was there and it's been going for a long time and it was, it was filthy and awful, and, and, but they had done the best they could. Well, the government came along and said, no, we need this piece of land. You can't live here anymore. So what we're going to do is we're sending the bulldozers in tomorrow and we're going to bulldoze over your houses and caravans and tracks and you must go. A very well-known South African activist, Sunet Bridges, went in and, and got a stay a order uh, that the government could not bulldoze down these houses until these people had found another place to live. And the government then said, all right, we will give you this piece of land to live on and we are going to bulldoze your shacks in 10 days. So the piece of land that they gave to these whites is an unreconstituted garbage heap in Kultain Filet. Now, imagine this. It hasn't been compacted. It hasn't anything. It is just an, a recently unused garbage heap. So it has broken bottles, tins, filth, garbage, rotting food, condoms, uh, everything sticking through the soil. The government then went and put up some houses. Well, these are corrugated iron shanties with no foundation, so they are just perched on the top of the, this garbage heap. And uh, they have got four walls and a roof, no windows, no ventilation, no electricity, no running water, no nothing. So for 300 of these houses, they installed five faucets for running water for these 300 families that were supposed to move there. Um, then no toilets, no nothing, no electricity, nothing. So these people moved there. And on the second night that they, was, they were there, there was this biggest storm that that area has had in years. Well, the holes in their roofs were obviously visible then, and the water came pouring through. So they were knee-deep in this garbage this mush mash of filth they were knee deep in because they don't have beds so they were sleeping on the, on this mud and a wind came up and because those houses had got no foundations they were blown over they found them four streets away these houses now across the road from this white government designated settlement is black rdp housing which is an informal settlement by the government for the blacks they have solar heating, they have electricity, they have running water, they have toilets in every single house. They have brick houses with proper foundations, they have roads, they have everything. So these people at, uh, at Munsieville, they had to live there, they had nowhere else to go. So they moved into this place and this charity that I told you about earlier on took pity on these people. and started uh, getting donations to put concrete floors into the houses because it is now winter in South Africa and it is a very, very cold, miserable winter. And just uphill from this settlement is another settlement where the water rushes down open, open pipes and onto their, their garbage heap. So they are always knee-deep in, in unbelievable, stinking, disgusting filth. Wow. So they had started putting concrete floors into these houses for these people. And that is why one of the reasons why they need money so badly. These people didn't have beds. They didn't have blankets. They have scarcely got clothes and they had no foods. And, and there is one uh, porta potty put up for each five houses. Now it's got a 10 gallon bucket and they are changed once a week. So can you imagine five families using one bucket for a week? It just, it, it, is, it, it is mind boggling that this is how the government thinks that white people deserve to live. Yeah. So these people are ill. 
They are dying of malnutrition. They are sick. The babies are dying. Um, uh, man, so the, 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 this charity organization had a charity drive just before the winter, and they went to take stuff, uh, blankets and food and whatever, to these people in Munsieville. Well, they were handing out the donations, and the blacks from their nice houses came across the road, and they were demanding that they get given these donations as well. So the little white girl in charge of this said, well, you know, if babies are hungry, babies are hungry, and a baby is a baby, black or white. So yes, help yourselves. Once the white people that it was designated for have theirs. The blacks started going crazy about, we don't like this food. We don't eat the tins of this. We don't eat cans of that. We don't want rice. We don't. Well, nobody asked them. You know, if they really need donations to such a degree that they need to come and take away from the whites, then be grateful for what you're getting. So the whites are under terrible threat in South Africa. And there are a million and more of them. That's one third of the white population living like that. Wow. Of which 350,000 are children. Now, in South Africa, you pay for school. You have to wear a school uniform. There are not buses that pick you up to take you to school. You have to get yourself there and back. And you pay for your school books. Now, if you are living in those circumstances without a single hope in the world of ever getting a job again because you, you're white, how, how are you going to send your children to school? So this charity asked, could they please put up a small building where they could school the younger children in reading and writing. And the government said, no, you may not have permanent um, buildings on that garbage heap, only what we've given you. So they asked, could they put up a little clinic um, where some good doctors would give their spare time to help these people? And the government said, no, you may not put up a permanent structure on this piece of property. So that, that, camp is a picture of the, I don't know how many there are, we are trying to find out how many. We believe there are 800 plus of those camps in South Africa, but we don't know for sure. So that is just a picture of how these whites, who were once middle class, hard workers, God-fearing, church-going, good people, what they have been reduced to. So the question of why do they not leave South Africa, how? How? Right where your next meal is coming from, where are you going to get air tickets and money for visas? Yeah. And when no one is going to help you either. I mean, in some cases, some of the people that we now see coming to um, Europe, they're fleeing their conditions. They, ha they, have, they have the money to get out, right? They've paid people to get on boats or something, you know? Yes. Yeah. And in this case, we're talking about a situation where the government is disincentivizing other companies to hire, hire a minority in the country by law. And I mean, this is just going to spiral out of control. Can you, can you imagine if this was done to any other people than whites? If, if this was a government policy, my God, we, we would hear about it until our ears were bleeding, you know? Well, uh, the government has put out uh, uh, an edict. It's, it's not a law. It's an edict saying that municipalities, which are town councils and, and government departments must rather keep uh, uh, vacant jobs vacant. They must not give it to a white. It must be left vacant. So people who have studied all their lives, who have gone, gone to school, gone to university, got degrees, worked hard, kept that country running, are now living on garbage heaps. And their job is being taken over by four blacks who cannot do the job. And that leads into the next subject, the downfall of the country. So we have one electricity supply commission in South Africa. It's a parastatal. It's partly owned by the government. We don't have a choice of who you get your electricity from. It's ESCOM or nothing. So ESCOM has not built or maintained a single power station in that country since 1994. So the power grid is falling to pieces. And what they have in South Africa is power sh load shedding, which means that the government chooses or ESCOM chooses an area, always white, never the black areas where they turn off the power for X amount of hours or days at a time. 
Now they go from three hours to seven days. Power outages. Now you have to understand that, that as I said before, the, these people who still have homes, their whole security system depends on electricity. If your power is out for more than a day at a time, your gate batteries go flat, your alarm system batteries go flat, your cell phone, everything is done by cell phone in South Africa, your cell phone batteries go flat. So you are a sitting duck. But to add to that, Eskom then publishes every day where the power outages are going to be and how long they are going to be for. So they are giving every day a roadmap to the criminals and telling them, go to this area because the whites are helpless. So that's one of the things that is happening in South Africa. Now, South Africa is a very dry country, very, very dry. We have seven-year cycles, seven years of rain and seven years of drought. And at this moment, we are in a seven-year drought. And uh, our esteemed Minister of Water Affairs said that the water shortage is due to the apartheid government because we built the dams too big. If we had built smaller dams, they would have filled up quicker and there would be plenty of water for everybody. Mm. So the big dams take too long to fill and that's why we have a water shortage. It's apartheid's fault. Right, right. The, the Minister of Science and Technology said that South Africa didn't ever, ha they never saw the problem of lightning striking people. But it's apartheid's fault because lightning only hits black people and it needs to be investigated and forbidden to happen because it's apartheid that caused this. <laughs> so these are our esteemed ministers in charge of the whole country. And these are the comments that they are making. The Minister of Law and Order said, if you do not like the crime rate in South Africa, stop whining and leave the country. Right. But uh, but they can't. That's the no, problem. Well, let, let's speak about that a little bit and, and what can be done, of course, by others to to help the situation, to get to a point where we can start helping each other out. Because I, think, I still think this boils down to not only the, the information struggle that I mentioned earlier, but basically people... You know, people don't know that that's the primary reason they don't understand. They're they're fed first of all with lies about it. So even if something was raised, they they probably would look the other way because they feel well, you know, they were evil anyway, so they deserve it or something like that. But I mean, I've seen articles from from whites in in South Africa. Well, at least they claim they're from there. That that deny not maybe everything. It's it's a long story that you've shared with us. Uh, but but many of the things, maybe not specifically about the poverty per se, but but there somehow is violence targeting whites in South Africa and whatnot, and they keep writing about it and they keep laughing at it as it doesn't exist. And that those people who speak about it, it's just, uh, you know, they're just lying and they're, they're really horrible racists and all these kinds of things. And, and, and there seems to be that type of struggle when people go to try to find out they encounter uh, online as well, of course, not only through the mainstream, but they encounter a lot of material that counters all of this. H mm. How do you propose we from the outside, like, beyond, of course, listening to people like yourselves, but how can we get a clearer picture? Is, is, there, is, there, is there anybody that's done a more definitive documentary of, on, on these kinds of things that you're talking about? Or, or how is, the, is there any independent media that had covered a lot of the things that you talk about? You know what the problem is, Henrik, and, and, and this is a very, very sad truth. The, the same activist that I told you about, Sunit Bridges, now she took some of those people from Coronation Bull and she is trying to build a place called Tainfully. Um, they bought the land and they are putting up really good houses and they are trying to start a self-supporting community of whites. Um, and if it's successful, they will then build more Tainfully's. So, some people came out, a BBC contingent came out and some press people from Belgium came out to film Plain Filet and what is happening there. Well, it costs her an awful lot of money to set this whole thing up and to help to accommodate the film teams and everything. What the end result of that was, was a totally uh, biased uh, documentaries that came out on the part of these film companies that said that she particularly was an incredible racist and, and was uh, trying to go back to the apartheid era. They of course, see, yeah. They did not see one thing good in what she was doing, not a thing. 
good about yeah, it. Yeah, of course. So now the South Africans are a little bit um, disenchanted with the world press and, and very unhappy when they come in to film things because they know that that, that the sympathy is not going to be there. The, the minds are made up before they go and do these documentaries. Of course, yeah. So you'll find a BBC documentary was done in the white squatter, squatter camps by a, a black British guy. I can't remember his name right now. It was two, two uh, videos were made by him. But also making a kind of a laugh in your sleeve about these whites, you know, because, well, you know, they, they're such big bad people. Right. Yeah. Now, the American Freedom Party recently um, sent an observer over to South Africa, a Canadian guy. They sent him over to South Africa on a fact-finding mission to come back and write a book um, and, a, a, and a pictorial study of what he found over there. He, he has just recently come back, maybe six weeks ago, and is busy writing the book with some South African authors. But I... I was instrumental in setting up his tour, so I set him up with the squatter camp people, et cetera, et cetera, and did his itinerary. So, so I know exactly what he saw and what, and he came back horrified. Mm. The problem is, who buys books? Right. Who cares enough? Well, to buy well that's what I'm saying. It's it's that's why I'm talking about independent people, of course, who uh, who can look at it objectively and also go in there with the. Uh, you know, with with cameras. And I mean, it's, it's never going to come from BBC because I think part of this as well is part of the propaganda that that they cover when it comes to what's happening in South Africa is intended to be targeted by the towards the whites in that country, right? So the the British need to know that. Look here, this is what this is what happens when you go this way, kind of thing. You know, so they, they yes. it's different ways and capabilities. They're trying to keep people in check, but that's what I'm saying. We need like an independent uh, film company or something that can really go and detail this and share this for free online on the way. I know all of this costs money. I know this would take time and all of this, but in, I mean, that's in my view, that's the, one of the first things that have to be established that the information have to get out to people so that they can make that judgment for themselves and realize what, what is at stake, you know? Well, um, we have some small, personal people, not not uh, independent companies. We have very, very brave South Africans doing exactly that now, putting up YouTubes. Um, there's a website, Stop the White Genocide in South Africa. The, the lady who runs that website puts up a YouTube every single month detailing all the white murders and all the bad things that have happened in South Africa that month. Now, what you have to understand is that in South Africa, you can be disappeared. And my fear is that these people are putting painting such a large target on their own backs by being patriots and being stand-up, truth-telling people that right. they will just disappear from sight because they are definitely putting targets on their own backs. Right, yeah. Um, a friend of mine works extremely hard in all the squatter camps in South Africa. She has branches in every province, which is a state in South Africa, in the United States. And she has volunteers. Now, they don't get paid astronomical salaries. They don't get paid anything. And these are white people who are unemployed, devoting every second of their time to their fellow white South Africans. Now, trying to get somebody like that out of the country is an absolute nightmare. You, you just cannot do it. You cannot do it. The, the, the government says the whites must go back and they put it in print and they say it in parliament. The whites must go back to Europe where they belong. But if you try and get your paperwork together to go somewhere, because you're not going back anywhere if you've been in South Africa 400 years, what are you? My, my father is Dutch. My mother is Scots. Where do I belong? Who, what am I? Who am I? Well, so, I'd, I'd say you're, you're you're European. You come. Your ancestors have lived in Europe for for thousands of years. You know that's that's. I, I know that you might have a different opinion on that, and I, I'm not claiming that I can be in a position to understand that since I was born in Europe and I and, and I'm from there. But it's almost like I, I wish. This is my point. What I want to get to is that I wish that there was a concerted effort by Europeans then to help our 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 cousins who who come from. 
you know, Dutch, German, French, uh, etc., st- even some Scandinavian stock to to yes. come to come back and to and to continue their way of life, but somewhere in Europe and be protected, just like they want to protect all these refugees now they're coming to Europe. Yes, absolutely. But but you see, as, from my research, as, as I understand it, either the United Nations or Amnesty International has to declare South Africa an unsafe country for whites. Now, despite the fact that Dr. Gregory Stanton from Genocide Watch, which is a United States-based organization that keeps an eye on all the countries in the world for possible genocides and genocides happening. Now, Dr. Gregory Stanton was a very, very vocal voice against apartheid. He stood up and marched and screamed against apartheid. The Dutch journalist that I told you about earlier, Ariana van State, she went to Gregory Stanton and she said to him, look, there is a genocide happening in South Africa and you need to go and investigate it. So after many, many, many months of persuasion and providing him with facts and figures, he went to South Africa to have a look for himself. I believe it was in 2012 was his first visit there, where he put South Africa on stage five of eight stages of genocide. But he also said that South Africa is in all eight stages of genocide. However, it is such a slow genocide without thousands of bodies in the street every day that it is very hard to quantify or even qualify what stage we are at. The genocide is underway, but it is a very slow genocide. Genocide. And it's it's broken up because there are um, attacks on individual, uh, you know, people, and and they're they're targeted here and there, and it's it's not mm-hmm. in that sense it's mm-hmm. not concerted. But but at the same time, there is obviously a well a, a machine behind all this that is basically creating these conditions. I mean, I can compare the situation maybe to well, not not it's not comparable, but I'm saying um, when I look at the media in certain European countries, I, I see how the dialogue. Is, is ramped up against the native population, whereas basically, you know, if an immigrant comes to Sweden, they can they can very quick, if they learn the language, read about how just how horrible and racist Swedes really are, and they're the ones who are holding you down. And this and the yes. liberal media is really, you know, feeding this, well, really, division and hatred against the native population. And I would expect that's also something that lies at the backdrop in, in South African media. Re- yes, because... Um you spoke about that, that maybe you did, um, a European guy, a Brazilian, I think it was, a, maybe a Brazilian, but anyway, he put up a, a, a plea for other countries to take South Africa. South Africa yes, back that's right, the, the, the partition there, yes. Yes, so th- there, there is on YouTube um, a TV interview uh, with Dan Roach and a couple of others about their uh, reaction to this thing. Now, the white TV presenters are saying they are shocked, disgusted, and horrified, which is what you were talking about earlier. Um, the, the, the whites themselves have got their heads stuck in the sand and don't want to see this. Yeah. So there was this whole thing on TV where they said they are absolutely disgusted. They cannot understand how any white person could could want to call this a genocide. South Africa has got its problems, but this is not a problem in South Africa. And uh, they had Dan wrote on that program, and he said, look, uh, there isn't white ethnic cleansing or genocide going on. You cannot deny it. Well, he was laughed at. Yeah. So what, what I think, and having not been out of South Africa very long and having been very well off when I was there, um, this is what I think. The people who are coining it off off of South Africa right now are quite happy to fill their pockets while they are still safe. Now, they have the money and they live in gated, guarded communities. They drive on roads where they do not have to pass the squalor and the the horror of the black and the white squatter camps. Um, And until somebody in their family is either murdered or robbed or whatever, they can afford to ignore because they have a visa in their passport or a foreign passport in their possession. They have money offshore and they can leave at the drop of a hat. Where these people that we are talking about 
who are dispossessed of everything, cannot even think about leaving. If you are making money hand over fist, which is still possible in that country, you are kind of obliged to not notice that things are going to help. And so that is the, the, the divide in South Africa. But in the, in the white population, those who do not wish to see, because they, that is what it is, they do not wish to see it. And those who do see it and are suffering it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's very, very difficult to to try to get this through. As I, as I mentioned earlier, I saw actually after the Dylan Roof um, shooting oh. in Charleston, you know, I saw this is one South African. And it's just one article. I'm, I'm not picking this out. It's extraordinarily, you know, spectacular or anything like that or particularly, uh, you know, wicked in any way. But it was a good just like a little sample, a pick of, of some of the things that comes up now and then. But it was basically this uh, white South African woman. She was writing about how. Uh, you know, how, how she had met horrible people like Dylan Roof online yes. and they kept claiming that there were somehow a genocide in South Africa. And she kept saying, you know, these people are wrong. I have to laugh at them. And, and, and that's the kind of battle that's going on. Now, do you think that these individuals are simply misinformed? They don't really see what's going on or, or are they part of another agenda? Are they de just denying it and, and can't face the reality? Or is it possible that, as it is with some European countries, that you have people who are in uh, you know, very, very homogenous areas, they keep lobbying for diversity, but they actually are never in those areas and never actually get to see some of those, uh, the, the clashes that occur between people, you know? There you go. There you go, Adrian. Yeah. It is so easy to sit in your little ivory tower protected from the rest of the world and, and spout off this liberal, oh, I nearly swore, nonsense, uh, <laughs> liberal nonsense, and have that liberal viewpoint, because in your little ivory tower, you are so protected, and you don't have to see it. And once again, you have the education system, which, which is incredibly liberal and anti-white. So you've gone through that whole system, and, and you have blinkers on. And until it hits you or your pocket, you are not going to see it, because you refuse to see it. And so it's the, the, the same time that I'm fighting and people like me are fighting the media blackout on the subject. We are fighting our own people. Yes, more than any us, almost. Yeah. Send us hate mail. And, and, and uh, you would be astonished at some of the things that I have been called and told because I'm a liar. Right. And now it's right in front of your eyes if you just open them. Well, it's this idea too, Karen, that it's like you, you it, it doesn't matter because you can't, you can't defend yourself. You can't stand up to your own interests. If you if you are white, you are in a in a different and separate category of one who's the 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 symbol, the the, the epitome of the perpetual oppressor, right? So so whenever you stand up to yourself, oh my God, it's another Holocaust. The SS army is marching in, and that's it, right? Absolutely. And you know a thing that I haven't mentioned to you, but really needs to be mentioned, because there's a Chinese influence in South Africa. Now, I saw a map the other day of where in Africa China owns the mineral rights, and it's practically the whole of Africa. So the Chinese have been, because of um, South Africa's um, agreement with BRICS, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, because of their uh, agreement with those countries, the Chinese have been pouring into South Africa and um, they were finding it very difficult because they were not classified either white or black. So they had to abide by the BBEE -E rules. So in 2008, our wonderful ANC government in their infinite wisdom declared that Chinese are now black. So that none of them <laughs> really? are to, yes, wow. in South Africa, if you're Chinese, you are classified black. In other words, you can join in in the fight against whites. Yes. Yeah. yes, you can. And none of the laws that apply against whites apply against you because you are black. Now, I don't know how the Chinese in China feel about being black, but they are. So, so that law was passed in 2008 so that the Chinese could bypass any of this stuff that other people have to abide by. And what is amazing is that the, you talked about the xenophobic riots in South Africa. Well, there are so many foreigners in South Africa right now because, they, as every other white country, they they are being they are pouring over the borders, uh, uh, unstoppable hordes of them. But the blacks in South Africa um, do not.
do not approve of this because the unemployment rates are over 50%. Exactly. So if they cannot get jobs and the houses and the free electricity and the free everything promised by the AMC government, they don't see why these foreigners should get it. So what they do, they do is they take to the streets and they riot. And they burn down and loot and destroy these foreigners' shops. But another thing we have not addressed is that the Winnie Mandela invented a torture called necklacing. Now, Willie Mandela invented this uh, against uh, one of her little guys who was uh, a murderous little horror that turned against her. So she had him necklace. And necklacing consists of either cutting off your arms below the elbow or tying your arms to your body with barbed wire and then putting over your shoulders a rubber tire, pouring gasoline on it, and setting it alight, and then dancing around you and singing songs while you writhe in agony and burn to death. Now, Winnie Mandela said, with our matches and our necklaces, we will turn South Africa black. But the majority of necklacing is black on black, not black on white. So when these xenophobic riots started, they started necklacing these Zimbabweans and other Somalis and all the rest of them in the streets. And... Uh, the world stood up and took, paid attention for once to what yeah. is going on in South Africa. Felt, felt very sorry for these blacks, and there was a whole outcry. But um, the um, Minister of Finance or Minister of Commerce or whatever said, and here, here's another little gem for our collection of our minister's sayings, said that these foreigners need to tell the locals their secrets of running a business because they have secretive ways of doing it. They need to tell the locals so that the locals can also have successful businesses. So mm. essentially they deserve to die because they're keeping the secret of success from the local people. <laughs> really? Wow. You know, South Africa is such a mess, Henry. It is such a mess. And there are so many undercurrents and so many different things going on there that, that it is impossible to get a, a good picture of what is happening. And if a film team were to go there, independent or otherwise, they would need to spend a year because every single day there is new garbage coming out of South Africa. The latest one is the, the, the education of the ministers in charge. They are finding that more and more of these top people who are paid more than anyone else in the world, if they look at their resume, they have got uh, doctor, doctorates and masters and bachelor's degrees, which do not exist. So when they were given the job, they were never given a background check for it. So we have uh, ambassadors to other countries with, with PhDs that don't exist. We have got the guy, oh, here's one for you. The guy running the railways in South Africa, he has got this PhD in engineering. So the blacks in South Africa, a lot of them commute to work on the trains, on commuter trains. And uh, if a train is late, they will burn it to the ground. So the next day, obviously, there's one train left, so less than there was the day before. So they have to overcrowd on the, on the trains that are available, so they burn them to the ground because now there's not enough space on the trains for them to get to work. So over the years, our, our trains have been di diminished to a degree that they're, they're getting burnt every day because there's just one or other protest against them. So they put out the six billion rand, six, 60 billion rand tender for trains for South Africa. And this PhD in engineering guy orders them from another country where their engineers told him that these trains are too tall. They will not run under the bridges in South Africa. They will not run under the overhead lines and they will not run under the... the overpasses because they are too tall. Well, he didn't listen. So they spent all these mon this money. The trains were, were built to specification and delivered. And guess what? Oh, my goodness. Shock of shocks. They can't run in South Africa. Mm. So now we have these billions of rands worth of trains that are useless in South Africa. So obviously they needed a scapegoat. So they started investigating th the people. And this guy's taking the hit. Well, he should. He should, because he doesn't have even a, a, a matric, probably, never mind a university degree. But this is a class of people running South Africa. Well, 
I mean, it's, obviously this is being funded still to a certain extent, and if there is no knowledge in, in running the country and, and the processes that have been run previously by educated people who know what they're doing, it's obviously going to fail eventually. It will go, it, it will go under either on, on a functionality basis or it will go bankrupt trying to keep, you know, keep propping it up. Is is what do you see for the the future? How is this going to turn out? What is the what's going to happen next? Do you think is it just going to get slowly and slowly worse, or is it going to be a radical difference in some way? Well, um, it, it it would appear that the, the the downfall of all infrastructure in South Africa is speeding up because for, for the first. For the first, say, 10, 15 years of the ANC rule, things, things kind of just dropped along, you know. But if you don't maintain things, they are going to fall apart. So the power stations have fall, fallen apart. They are pumping billions of gallons of raw sewage into the sea and into the rivers in South Africa because the water purification works have not been maintained. Now, in South Africa, because it's such a dry country, we recycle water. So the sewage is recycled and go, goes through intricate processes so that it is able to be used as drinking water at the end of it. But those plants are all falling apart. So instead of recycling the water, that raw storage is being pumped into the rivers, the lakes, the dams, and water is becoming unusable at the same time as we are undergoing a terrible drought. The roads are falling apart. There are potholes in South Africa that entire cars can fit into. They just fall into these holes. The electricity is, is, is finished, the, the trains are finished, the, the water processing is finished. I mean, the, everything that keeps the, the hospitals, let me touch on hospitals for you. We had the best, best hospitals in the entire world. We really did. We had the most incredible medical infrastructure. And in the past eight years, the expected lifespan of the African was increased by 20 years because of the medical technology and science that there was available to them. Well, since the ANC has taken over, it has gone down again, that same 20 years that it was increased. Um, the baby birth um, deaths have increased astronomically under the, the, the black rule. AIDS is, is one of the biggest things in South Africa. I, I don't know the exact figures, but it's probably about three in 10 are AIDS positive and, and maybe more than that. So uh, Mbeki, the second black president of South Africa, declared that AIDS was a man-made thing in order to make the blacks wear condoms and not breed so much. We were trying to, to commit a genocide against them by talking about AIDS. Right. So yeah. When they went to an international conference on AIDS, where people had this incredible scientific stuff on their stands, I mean, they they had PhDs and, and 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 incredibly intelligent people showing the latest medical advancement in AIDS. There was the South African contingent with lemons, garlic, and beetroot on their the display on their stand there, because for them this was the cure for AIDS. So. And amongst all this high technology at some Western European con- conference on AIDS, this is what South Africa had. They did not believe in it, although millions upon millions of blacks are infest- infected by it and are dying. Now, that's one of the places that the rest of the world is giving billions of dollars in aid, but the hospitals in South Africa do not have anti-aid retrovirals which money is donated for by the rest of the world. The hospitals have no beds, they have no water, they have no food, they have Cuban doctors, they, they, they have nothing. If you were to see pictures of the government hospitals in South Africa, you would be sick and you would never understand why people go there. Because when you go to a South African government hospital, you need to take your own mattress, which they will put in a corridor and make you share with somebody else. You take your own blankets, your family have to bring your food and your drugs in. A guy went in the other day for an appendix operation. They cut him from breastbone to hip bone and didn't stitch him up afterwards and sent him home like that. Wow. So those are the hospitals in South Africa. And this is how that country is falling apart rapidly. So it is not a slow decline. It is speeding up 
astronomically because the things that have taken have been able to sort of maintain themselves slowly through the years. It is now 21 years of AMC rule and things are falling apart. And now what they're doing is signing a contract with the Russians for nuclear power stations in South Africa. Is that not a recipe for absolute disaster? Yeah, I did not know that. I, I think partially, Karen, that, that if there is such a thing as a success story in people basically going their own way as you said before want a desire to be left alone and to and to preserve who they are and live in their own way on their own terms and if 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 that is something that has been a, a recipe of, of success not only of course do our controllers need to rewrite that story and say actually it was horrible it was the worst thing the world has ever seen let's never do it again but i think it's a I think that's done in a concerted effort to try to basically say, you know, if, if you go that way, you're never going to be successful because in the times we're in right now, they want to try to achieve a, a multicultural utopia. I, th I think some people generally sincerely believe within the system that's promoting it that this is going to be achieved. I, I suspect there are other people's maybe higher up the ranks that knows that this never will be able to be achieved, but they're creating these conditions for, for other reasons that, that could be debated, of course. But it, it's built on a premise of, of egalitarianism, of, of equality, of this thing that we there is a deep, desperate desire for, 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 for this multicultural utopia to work. We have to assume that everyone is equal and they can do everything as well as everyone else can. It doesn't matter. There's no difference between us. But if this is not the case, if this is untrue, if we are different, if we have different capabilities, if we are you know, good at different things, what have you, then this is something that has to be denied at all costs so that this multicultural experiment that we're going through not right now in the West, of course, not in many other countries, but th then this has to be pushed through. And, mm. and, and so... Someone going their own way, someone being separate, separateness, apartheid, being apart from other people, then that's something that at all costs would have to be destroyed. And so I think to a certain extent, what has happened in South Africa is 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 partially due to the timing of the whole thing. That it was it's it's at the worst possible time when when the when the establishment is seeking to reform the global community into or all the different nations into a global community rather. And 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 that's one of the things that happened. That this this success story that you guys had had to be destroyed for them to be able to pull through and convince everyone else that in fact it was it was not good. They didn't have anything. It was in fact a, a horribly suppressive system that was holding everyone down. And it's finally now that you know you guys are free from this uh, oppression that 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 the country is finally going to bloom into its full potential, right? That That is a wonderful story because they call South Africa the rainbow nation. Well, as far as I'm concerned, if the rainbow were entirely black, well, then that would be true. But there is no rainbow in that nation. And there is no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And so that leads me into wanting to talk to you about some political parties in South Africa because um, it is very important to understand how that works. In South Africa, you do not vote for a person. You, you, you here you have this whole gamut of people running for, for president and you can vote for them. But in South Africa, you do not. You vote for a party and then the winning party chooses its people. So they choose the president. You do not. And um, until recently, the, the uh, DA, the Democratic Alliance, was the white face in parliament in South Africa. And... There are a few, a few seats held by the Fred, uh, Fred's Front Plus, the Freedom Front Plus, a few white, uh, white seats hold. But essentially, the white population have no voice in politics. Now, recently, uh, a fledgling political party started up. They're called uh, the Front National, and they are trying extremely hard to get a voice for the whites in parliament. So what they did was they went to the United Nations and asked for accreditation to be allowed to speak on behalf of the white South Africans. And they got that. Now, they are trying desperately to raise funds so that they can go to the meetings and, and speak for, for the white South Africans. But what they found was that 
despite all the promises of these many very small white, supposedly white political parties in South Africa, who had said that the world is not listening to us and they're not listening to the plea of the whites. So when a Front National went to the United Nations, they found that nobody had ever asked for the United Nations to look at the cause of the whites in South Africa. There had not been one application put in there. While these other white, so-called white political parties in South Africa were blowing their own trumpets about the hard work they were doing on behalf of the whites and that nobody was listening to them. So Front National have put in a request for, for the United Nations to please have a look at the, the white genocide happening in South Africa. We don't know how that will go or where that will go anywhere. They right. also, um, the contingent went to the unrepresented uh, nations conference in Australia and gave evidence on behalf of the white South Africans about what is happening there and of trying to get them declared an unrepresented people. Um, we don't know where that will go either. But I personally want to really uh, give, give kudos to Front National because they are also just ordinary people. I know a lot of those people. They are just ordinary white South Africans suffering and struggling the same as everybody else is in that country. But they are the first one who have lived up to their promises to stand up and go to these uh, big organizations and ask for a voice on behalf of the white South Africans. They are also the ones who stood up and organized um, defending the statues, when that whole road statue throw poop at it happened and they were going to pull it down, they sent people to uh, protest and to protect other white South African hero statues in South Africa. They have offered a home for them because they are going to be taken down. They have offered a home for them so that they can be kept instead of destroyed. We don't know where that is going to go either, whether they will be just broken down. But I, mu I must say that there is an awakening in South Africa and, and in a very small degree across the world to what the whites are suffering in South Africa. There is a small glimmer of hope. But the thing that the South Africans want most, and they still want it to this day, is a fork start, a, a homeland that belongs to them. And they have suggested the Cape, where they first landed, where there were no blacks, where there are no blacks who have a claim to the land. And they have suggested that they get given that back. Now, when the blacks, the whites voted in 1992 for um, the end of apartheid, the question of the referendum that they voted on was, should the government continue negotiations towards the end of apartheid and a tripartite government for South Africa. Mm -hmm, right. And now the whites voted overwhelmingly. There was an 85% voter turnout and 67 or 68% of those voted yes. That we should continue negotiations towards a tripartite ruling party. They did not say, yes, we want this country turned over to the ANC black communist government. Right. So they were fooled from the very beginning. But the point I'm trying to make is they were Codesa, the Codesa agreement was also signed. And in those negotiations, it was said that white uh, folk start would be considered and it would be put under discussion by the tripartite rulers of the country. And they would consider whether the whites could get their own homeland. Well, that has never gone anywhere. So it there is an agreement standing in South Africa that the whites should be considered for their own homeland. It's never going to work because 90% of the tax base in South Africa, despite all the problems that the whites are suffering, 90% of the tax base is whites. So they, they, so they are need, not, they need them. That's what you're saying. They, they don't want them, but they need them. So, so if, okay, that's a good point because if, if whites are so, just absolutely horrible and oppressive and whatnot. Why not let them disconnect then and go their own way and set up their own country? But then that makes sense because then there is a position of 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 need here that to a certain extent their production base is 
is wanted to be able to continue to uh, to fund the country and to find fund the the government that it seems to as you've been described incapable of taking care of certain things really 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 uh, Henrik, it, it, it is an un you can't wrap your mind around it because at the same time that they are saying kill the boer go back to europe where you belong if you don't like it here just leave they need you and they make it impossible for you to leave because there are certain papers that you need to immigrate. So you need an um, you need a police clearance. You need a, a, a birth, but not just your small birth certificate. You need the full birth certificate. You need a marriage certificate. You need all of these things, but you need to get them from Home Affairs in South Africa. So if you ever get to the counter in Home Affairs, which you can take up to five, six days of waiting in a queue and going back the next day and waiting again and going the next day and waiting again, you hand your paperwork in. Now, in my case, I married an American, born and bred in America. He had been in South Africa for two years at the time. So when I went to apply for my unabridged, that's the word I was looking for, unabridged marriage certificate, I finally got it after about eight months of waiting. And on that certificate, it said that my husband was a South African. Hmm. So I had to go back and undergo the whole process again. And then you have to get a police clearance. Well, that can take two years for them to get to you. So I got mine. And when I went to the American uh, embassy to hand it in, they told me it was printed on the wrong paper. I needed to go back and get another one. So you go back and you apply again, and that takes another two years, by which time many of your other papers have expired. So you need to start from the beginning again. So you understand that even if you have the means and the the, the qualifications to go to another country, the, white, the, the, the South African government makes it so impossible for you that you cannot get your paperwork together. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, Kiana, as you, what you've said already, obviously, then, then there, is, there is no desire to let people split off. But let's for a moment talk about what potentially, in your view, could be an ideal situation. Because as it stands right now, it's actually in many countries where there are a, a fairly large population that the political system is no longer able and capable to, to facilitate the different needs and interests. And the more... Well, you know, we know what diversity means. It means less white people, but the more the more diversity we get in, in some of our uh, Western countries or countries founded by Europeans, the more difficult it also bec becomes because all these different people have, have tremendously different needs. They have different backgrounds and cultures and all this kind of stuff. So it, it, it falls out of the hands of, of the politicians. But that would that would imply that maybe we're heading in a direction of smaller regions, at least maybe temporarily, not as the final kind of... Uh, you know, work around on this. But do you think that it's possible to, that something like that might be able to occur in South Africa? I mean, what, what would you wish for? What would be a good outcome, an ideal, if you could decide? Okay, there are only two routes to follow in South Africa. The, 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 the wish, the fervent prayer of the Afrikaner for a folk start, that they be given their own place. Now, there are two towns in South Africa. I don't know what... The second one is not as famous as Orania. There is Orania, which is a town that was bought by a white Afrikaner group. It is a totally white town. They have their own, their own money, their own everything. They don't even have a police force because it is so crime-free there. Um, you have to speak Afrikaans. You have to be an Afrikaner to go and live there. They are farming. They are interacting commercially with the rest of South Africa, and they are doing extremely well. They teach in Afrikaans. They teach the correct history of the country. They have their own schools, their own sports teams, their own everything. And they are doing incredibly well. But they are not self-governing. They still fall under the ANC government. So if the ANC decided tomorrow that blacks must be allowed in Orania, they would have to abide by the local laws and they would have to allow it. So although they are an incredibly successful town where they have built from a ghost town to a to a farming um, educating community that has got everything that a community needs and they are clean tidy uh, prosperous everything that they still fall under the ANC government so they change tomorrow right exactly yeah. they have already fended off a lands claim 
which is another thing we haven't touched on, but they have already fended off one because the people who wanted to claim the land that they built on, uh, they paid them cash and they went away with their claim. But another claim could happen tomorrow and the government could just as easily say, listen, you're not going to pay it out in cash. We are taking this land and we are giving it to a black tribe whose ancestor 500 years ago maybe grazed goat there because that's all you have to say you happened and that land belongs to your tribe. So it could happen tomorrow. But it, it is also a proof that Afrikaner self-governance is very good for the country and can work. Now, that is first prize for the Afrikaners in South Africa because they say they are as African as anybody else. They have a right to be there and they are not leaving despite the murders and despite the torture and despite everything, they are not leaving. That is first prize for them. I don't know whether I believe that will work or not. There are days when I think so and there are other days when I think, oh my goodness, they are still going to be surrounded, outnumbered by black people who are going to flood into their white country in the hopes of making a buck and uh, the whole story, will, the whole cycle will start again. Right. So, yeah. I don't know what I believe about that. Um, but if that is what the Afrikaners want, then in my prayers that is, and in and, and, and my talks, that is what I want for them because I, I, I can't make up their minds for them and I can't decide what is best for them. So being their number one prize, I truly hope that that can come to being and that they can have their own place finally. But for me, as somebody who left, and I did not flee the country, I, did not, I had no intentions of leaving, I, I met and married an American, and uh, he could not get a job in South Africa as a white man, and after two years there, he said, look, a, a man's man does not be supported by his wife. This, this is just not acceptable, and I'm taking you to my home where I can get a job, and I can support you. Yeah. So, I had no intentions of leaving. I I didn't I didn't flee the country. I came here because my I love my husband dearly. He's a good man. He wanted to look after me, and I cannot deny him that. So here I am. But in a way, it's a good thing because I'm much freer here to speak out against the injustices. Yeah. Do you do you go do you travel back regularly I, or you? I cannot. The ANC wow. will disappear me at the airport. Right. If I land in South Africa, I will not make it into so, the. Interest. So they they know about you. They have uh, have you yes. on the radar? Yeah. Yes, they do. I I I have an enormous target on my back. Enormous. I cannot go back there. Um. So the other thing that I think would be a good thing for for South Africans is to be allowed to go back to their European roots. Yeah. Now, despite the fact that they are kicking and fighting and don't want to do that. It would probably be the safest route for them. But we would then need to send, the other countries would need to send in airlifts to get these one million of them living in informal settlements, to get them out of there, because there's no way that those people could leave. And with every country in the world being invaded by black hordes and Muslim hordes, they do not have the financial ability to bring in more people that they would be fully responsible for until they got on their feet. So they would need to airlift them out, uh, provide them with housing and, and employment and uh, until they could get back on their feet and become contributing citizens to that country. So either of those solutions I don't see happening. I just see that if Julius Malema and his economic freedom fighters take over that country, they have a plan in place called Uhuru. And uh, if that were to happen and their Uhuru became real, within 48 hours they intend to get rid of every white in the country, to murder them and kill them. And they have plans in place which are perfectly viable. It could happen. It's, it's, not, a, it's not an African dream. It is an absolute possibility because the whites are spread out all over the place um, and, and easily targeted by determined black hordes of people. Now that is my fear that in, in, in a short period of time the whites will be wiped out and the rest of the world will say, oh my goodness, how did that happen? We never saw it coming and oh how sad and move on with their lives. Right. 
Now, yeah. that is a very doom and gloom picture, but the other two possibilities are so unlikely a fourth start or refugee status and being flown out of the country en masse. Um, what is left? Yeah. Well, Karen, there, there are others that we've uh, talked with on, on the program here that have uh, talked about the future a little bit. That, that what we're seeing is, is a culmination uh, in Europe, uh, Australia, America, etc., uh, that that this is on one in one way or another going to turn into a larger global version of of South Africa. That there are interests in this world that are directing resentment and and anger towards us. That ultimately will produce violence in in a similar uh, way as it has in South Africa. And again, not that the government, at least at this stage, are are sending military personnel and. And, and police to to kill people in a concerted effort like that, but it's something that occurs at at random, but quite f- frequently. There's something that occurs to people on the street level. Um, yeah. And if you are, you know, white and, and a native European, you will be targeted by by people who come into to your country and 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 resent you and and get taught that you're an oppressor, etc. What what do you think about that as a as a prediction? And I mean, is, is that a is that a reality? What do you feel since you've been experiencing? Uh, the the denial of this type of situation in your country. It's happening everywhere, Henrik. I watch the world in absolute dismay. I saw pictures the other day of, of, of these so-called refugees in their tens of thousands, just climbing up, climbing up the fence and pouring into Spain. I I uh, I don't know how we are to keep them out. And the problem is that the governments across the world seem to think that it is a perfectly okay thing to do. So the people themselves who do not want this, because people all over Europe and in the USA and in Australia and in the UK and everywhere, the people who of those countries have said, we do not want them. Secure our borders and drive them out. Yeah. Send them back home, but the governments themselves refuse to do that. So the people of the world are not represented by their governments who have a completely different view of the world than the people have. We vote them in, and in the minute they get into power, everything that they promised along the way is forgotten, and they go against every single thing that the people want. So in in the countries of the world, we are already being outnumbered because of this mass influx of people who, as I said before, have got no wish to integrate. They just bring their barbaric rape, murder, uh, torture, looting, and living on the doll with their hands out. I mean, give me, give me, give me because I deserve. And they're doing this to every white country in the world. Why do they not stay in their own countries where they chase the whites away, they have achieved their objective, they've got what they wanted, stay there. Right. Instead of flooding into other white countries and doing it all over again. So if all of these countries have got this problem, I mean, I live in Texas, and Texas is suffering incredibly by the influx of these illegals over the borders. And and because the the... The government here has refused the Border Patrol and ICE and all these people who were set up to keep them out or to send them home. They are now not, they've been instructed not to do their jobs. They are to house them, feed them, put them on buses and spread them all over the whole country. Um, These countries have got their own problems. And the the whites are going to be a minority worldwide. It doesn't matter where We we already are a minority worldwide. God, we're very few. In your own country, in your own white country. Yeah, I know. Which was your, you Swedish. So in your own folk start, which was Sweden, which was pure white. Pure white. Yeah. What are you today? Well, what, 16% uh, immigrants at least. I don't even know if we get the real numbers, to be honest. So You never get the real numbers. The whole world is refusing to tell the truth. To the, to the people because they are scared that we will stand up and revolt. But the problem is because they have dumbed us down, given us a wrong version of history, and frightened us to such a degree by spying on every aspect of our lives. They have scared us into silence or else given us so many government handouts that it is easier for us to just take the handout and shut up. So. In two ways, they've infiltrated everybody, and we have little to no hope of surviving as a race of whites. 
And when we are destroyed, the world is going into a dark ages because there is no innovation, no creative, no development, no research, no nothing amongst these black. So we are going to go once more into the dark ages. And we are seeing, seeing the signs of it with the censorship, the burning of the books, the breaking down of the statues, the burning of universities, the, the, the incredible more takers than makers because the balance is tipping all over the world between those who are paying the taxes and those who are living off the taxes. You've seen the debt in every country that they are in that can never be paid, ever, 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 ever. You're seeing the climbing unemployment, the climbing crime. The, the, it, it's an impossible situation. You know, we've always had uh, territory and, and preserved it for for our own and, and to be able to have our own interests and man maintain who we, who we are. This is something which um, never, I think, is going to go away. We just live in a, in a place right now where we are we're, we're, we're fooling ourselves. We were, people are generally very, very naive. They don't see yeah. what this is going to develop into or, or why this is being done. And, and many still, I think, hold a, a view that largely it's going to just, you know, be, a, a, we're going to have a wonderful time together, you know, and it's going to be, it's all going to be great. But the fact is, no, you see no other countries in this capability giving up uh, its, its territory in the way that we are doing right now in, in the Western world. And this is, co of course, going to have consequences. We just haven't wrapped our heads around this uh, at this stage. But it's it's starting to dawn on some people that, wait a minute, multiculturalism is actually causing us to move away from, uh, you know, generally historically high trust societies. People are, there's more criminality. People are spending more time inside in front of the television rather rather than to go out in your in your neighborhood and specifically for people who live in these called so-called transitional neighborhoods where the the population are ble are being replaced you know they they see the brown end of this they see what's happening they see that it's not you know uh, rainbows and and love and and uh, you know peace it's uh, it's quite the opposite karen but multiculturalism itself is racist because if if you leave people to their own devices they tend to congregate amongst like people. Yes. So the Mexicans will live in a Mexican area and the blacks will live in a black area and the whites will live in a... It, it comes naturally to people. They will always be those ones who cross the lines and, and, and feel liberated by doing so and feel good about themselves. But, but in general, people will congregate in groups that match themselves. And so multiculturalism itself is an enforced and, and a false paradigm. It, 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 it isn't real. It doesn't work. And nobody's happy. No, that's right. Well, I mean, it's a flat out replacement of the, of the population. They're officially, I've mentioned it many times, but there are official United Nations reports that are talking about, um, at, well, one of the excuses, there's many different excuses. So sometimes they say, well, the refugees, they have to escape in another instance. Well, they come so that they too can have access to, to an economy and a, and a good life. And then in the next moment, no, it's actually because you are not having any children and they need to replace you. They need to come okay. in and, and, you know, be workers of all the jobs that you refuse to, to do. And uh, we get all these different excuses all the time. But no matter what excuse they give us, it, it's le it leads to one thing, and that's the replacement of a people and a population and a driving out of them. And you see... It largely uh, due to what you just mentioned, people want to be with their own. So you see white flight in most of these countries and they go to other areas. The question is, where where are we going to be able to be? Where are we going to be left alone? Where are we going to be able to live in the way we want without being forced into a situation where we no longer have freedom of association, Karen? You know what, Hendrik? Now, I am the most pacifist person in the world. I really am. I I. I do not believe in violence in any form or shape. I, I retreat from it. But the, the only, and it makes me sick to my stomach to even think about it, the only thing that is going to save us is if we stand together. Now, I've been preaching that in South Africa for a very long time because the English and the Afrikaners hate each other with a passion unbelievable. Too bad. Yes. But there are only 3.5 million of them. So if they do not put their differences aside and stand up and have one big voice, they are never going to get anywhere. Now, that applies to us whites all over the world. Sure. If we do not forget 
that, well, I don't like the Germans because, and I don't like the Russians because, and I don't like the Australians because, and well, the New Zealanders, and oh my goodness, <laughs> we are going to have to forget all those petty differences because they really are petty. And then there's an, an all-out war being waged against us. And we have to stand together and stand up and say, listen, our ancestors fought for the right to live. They fought to, to have this country. They fought for, for a place in the, in the world. And we are going to fight again. If we do not do that, we are done for. And as I said, and I, I'm saying it again, I am not recommending civil wars. I'm not recommending that. But I'm saying my gut feeling is, if we do not forget all our differences, work together towards a common aim of saving the white race, we are done. Well, Karen, I think we should uh, leave people with that and uh, let them ponder upon what you've uh, shared with us here today. And uh, it's it's been a, a sincere and just right in the open, uh, you know, uh, situation that you've shared with us in terms of what hap- what is happening in South Africa of something that we are never told about in the media. We never hear about it. We always get the one version hammered uh, over us all the time. And th- and that's why this is so incredibly important to be able to get an insight into what actually is the, the, the other side of this. Because I think as most people know, they're listening to this show. They know how much the media is lying. We know that they're using it as a, as a tool for for social engineering and to steer people in a certain direction, to have them disarm them, uh, you know, their rationality and to, to, to give up and to, to control them in the way that they want. And, and this is one aspect of it, folks, of not being able to, to know and to, uh, to understand what happens in, in a situation like this. So this has been very important, uh, Karen. And uh, I, I want to thank you so much for what you do and for daring to speak out about this. And, and uh, why don't you give us some of the details again about uh, how people can support um, you know what you, what you guys are doing. If there's a, another way that people can get it, get in touch with you, and if there's something specifically you'd like to say in terms of how people can, I mean, are there efforts now to actually help try to get families out that want to leave South Africa to go back either to to Europe or to America or anywhere else where they can be safe? Is there any programs like that ongoing right now? Um, no, no, there are not any official programs of doing that. But I have I have set up a fund where I am trying to get people out of South Africa and to help them with their any legal fees, um, airfares, visas, legal fees required. I'm trying to help with that. But you're going to have to take it on faith that I am who I say I am and that the money will go to them because I cannot set up a charitable trust for this because it would expose the people and they would then uh, have no chance whatsoever. So I have a PayPal account, which is cooks, as in cooking food, C-O-O-K-S, 595 at yahoo.com, which is my PayPal account. And that is where I'm helping uh, a number of families who are, have applied for asylum and a, a number of families who are trying to get out of South Africa. And then, of course, if you want to help the South African people in South Africa and make sure that your money is going to the white people, South African Family Relief Project is, the, is my charity of choice. There are many others, but you need to be very careful because there are a lot of scams, and uh, uh, it pains me to say it. It really hurts me to say it because people are trying to make money off of the misery of the whites in South Africa. Mm-hmm. So you give your money, and it doesn't go where it's supposed to go. It goes into some person's pocket instead. There are a number of charities which you could give to, and if you want to write to me, you can write to Cooks595 at yahoo.com, and I will recommend some charities to you, but my charity that I have researched thoroughly and I know that every penny goes to the whites is South African Family Relief Project. Um, other than that, I don't know how you can help because the postal service, which we have not talked about in South Africa, is totally in chaos. Um, they've been on strike for over six months. The post offices have been burnt. The international uh, postal uh, receiving place has had the post thrown in the streets and uh, burnt. And if it does get there, you have very little chance of it not being stolen. If it's not stolen, it then goes to the tax man. So anything you send to South Africa, the charity receiving it has to pay tax on it, which is uh, decided by the by the revenue service in South Africa, they will open your parcel, decide what tax is due on it, and you have to pay it. So that sending goods which are desperately needed um, is a very uh, iffy way to go. 
because it probably it, it has a 99% chance of not reaching where it needs to be. So the best thing you can do is send money. And with the present exchange rate, which is about $13 to the rand and 20 pounds to the rand, um, uh, 20 rands to the pound, sorry, and mm -hmm. 30 rands to the dollar. I had that backwards. Um, your money goes a very long way in South Africa. Um, those are the only th channels that I could suggest because it is very hard to help these people. The government makes it impossible to help them. So those are the only things I can suggest to you. But if um, I have a, I have raised the visa fees and most of the airfare for a South African couple who are in great danger. They are in extreme danger of being disappeared or killed in South Africa and they need to leave urgently. I've raised most of the money for them. I, I they, will, they will come and live in my home, they will have my car until we can get them on their feet. So I need a couple of hundred dollars in order to get them here and we will then thank everybody personally. They will thank them personally once they get here. So you will know the money went to the right place. And any excess money raised will go to any legal fees that they need once they get here. So that's the best that I can suggest to you. Um, you either trust me or you don't. Yeah, well, and we haven't even talked about the way that some people are are tortured and, and die in, in the most gruesome, heinous ways. There are, there are many photos that I wish I'd never seen, you know, that I wish I could erase yeah. uh, from, from my, my memory. And, uh, well, Karen, we should, we should, uh, we should talk again at some point and discuss some of the other things we didn't get a chance to discuss here today. Um, it's, there's a lot more to it and there's a lot of different nuances and things that we didn't get a chance to, to discuss and talk about, but, you know, thank you again so much for coming on and, and, uh, keep up the good work, keep, keep, you know, being brave and, and talk about these things and, and keep spreading the word and, uh, and uh, don't 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 lose faith. I think there's a lot of people that are slowly kind of waking up to to the reality of how they're being hoodwinked from this. So you do a good job, Karen. Thank you so much again. Thank you very much, Henrik, and thank you from the entire white population of South Africa because it means such a lot to them. You have no idea the thank yous that come in after a show because it is important to give them hope. And your shows like yours are giving them hope that the world does care that they're not left on the tip of Africa dying like flies and nobody caring. So it is very important what you have done, just done. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Well, there we have it. That's our Red Eyes radio program for today. Thank you so much for listening, ladies and gentlemen, and for getting an inside perspective on this story. A small insight into one of the biggest and most distorted and lied about tragedies of our times. There is naturally more to this story and we'll continue to bring you information from other people who can tell you firsthand about their experiences and how they flat out deny that any of this is happening, that somehow this is all delusions. They uh, think that just because it's out of the press, it can't be true. Well, that's a big mistake to make. As uh, you regular listeners know, conspiracy by omission is uh, far from something new. We are uh, going to be back with uh, Dave Yorkshire from Mjölnir magazine out of the UK on Wednesday. And then we have Loren Murray, Dan Root and others joining us on the program after that. Well, for now, we say uh, thank you so much for listening. Once again, please sign up for a membership with us at RedEyesMembers.com. Get full access to our archived programs going back to 2006, both ours and all the other content we have for you. For now, we say stay well and thank you for using your brain for thinking, for researching, and preparing yourself for what needs to be done. Okay, don't forget to take care of your loved ones, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.